Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. There's nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I could barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass, and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer, before we realize she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and call my boyfriend. It's then I realize, no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service, they both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to call May down and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher, and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy, but pissed voice, but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad death perception. I assure him that I'm fine, he's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grew up around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car, and May rolls on the window a little bit, and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill, 
and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, What are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but Maya unlocks and opens the door and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows is never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space, so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and ask what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story and everybody in the car is super scared but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that? And she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark. But then I hear it through the small opening in the window. Swish, swish, swish. Maid ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down in my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against May's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams. You'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving? I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned, but there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old Corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window and when he orbited his way over there, I said, hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Quarter Ward definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, but he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kinda like when you knew there was gonna be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window like he's jousty with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break, but it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. 
Now Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5. So I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave. But nope. Caleb walks towards corduroy, trying to assess the situation. And Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window. Tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car. Then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb who sprints the other way down the road, cause that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth. This startles me, and I jump to the side of the car, hearing Corduroy smash the stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work, but Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He'd abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. May and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21 with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town, with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm going to call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. 
I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline, and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot, and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, and was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell isn't working, and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kid started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return, around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night, but nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you try to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it, it was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. 
Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only 5 feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay, close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice. So I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work. Either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out of town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, you know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. I was about 21 or 22 when this happened. I was in the military at Fort Sill and didn't know it, but Desert Storm was right around the corner. At the time, I lived in South Central Oklahoma on the outskirts of a small town called Duncan. I was helping a friend ground up some cattle that got out because someone had run across a T-section and went through their fence. It tore two posts down and left a 30-foot section open for the cattle to get out. We'd already found most of the cattle and we were missing another three or four, so we were out at 1am on dirt bikes trying to find them before someone hit one of them and sued his father. My friend and I went east and the other guys went north and south. One thing you need to understand about Oklahoma is that most of it is farmed, either cattle or crops. It is also divided into one mile sections for the most part. In other words, the roads all run north and south or east and west and intersect at one mile intervals. If you ask directions for something out in the country, you are more likely than not to get instructions that include, go three mile sections north and then two mile sections west. The area at this time was sparse and there weren't many homes. We didn't know how long the hole had been in the fence. My friend's father only checked the fence because he was missing livestock. They owned the entire mile section and a good portion of the adjoining mile section. The hole in the fence was on the east side of their land at the furthest distance from their house. They checked the fence for such holes on a weekly basis, so the hole could not have been more than two days old. James and I were riding on these old dusty, dirt roads with battery-powered spotlights to both show the way and to search for cattle. We'd stop at any of the million small wooden bridges and look to see if there were any cows down by the water. Our plan was to go out 10 miles and then go over a mile section and drive back 10 miles until we'd gone a total of 10 miles out and 10 miles over. Then we would do it all over again but on the north and south roads instead of the east and west roads. If you were to plot it a map, it would be a 10 by 10 grid. We had been at it since before 9pm, just as it was getting dark and we had already gone 10 miles out and about 3 miles over. I need to mention at this point that there are some mile sections that are not divided by roads and you have to turn one way or another at a T intersection. If that happens, we always took the road that went in our general direction of travel. If we were traveling east and came to a T and we'd already checked the road north of us, then we head to the south a mile and then head east again. 
Occasionally, an old farmer would pass away and leave his land to relatives who had no interest in farming and the land would be up for sale or just left alone for years. When this happens and the roads aren't used as much, nature reclaims them and you're usually left with a dirt road with weeds and grass growing on it or you're left with little more than an improved trail, usually two ruts with overgrown weeds and Johnson grass and occasionally a tree. We were on one of those rutted roads headed south to the next intersection where we turn east again. The land here was too hilly for cultivation and had been left alone for at least the last 30 years. We were both familiar with it and we hunted and fished there. This mile section and the next two were basically wild. At the end of the dirt trail would be a T-intersection, but the west side was fenced and the only option was to turn east again. At the end of this mile section, the road was a dead end, but we had to check it and the double back. We just made the turn back to the east when we saw something burning over the next rise. Grass fires are extremely dangerous and can get out of control in minutes. As we topped the rise, we saw the fire was actually in the middle of the dirt road. When we got to it, we found that it was a recliner that was burning, a blue lazy boy recliner. We stopped and threw some dirt on it and finally got it extinguished. James and I were wondering what kind of an idiot would do this and how strange it was to be in the middle of the road just burning. Satisfied that the fire was out, we got back on our bikes and idled past the recliner toward the end of the mile section, still a quarter of a mile in the distance. We found one of their cows at the bottom of the rise, about a hundred feet down the road. It was laying in half in and half out of the road. Its throat had been cut and it was laying there with its eyes open and tongue hanging out. There was blood everywhere. As we were looking at it and trying to figure out what happened, James said, hey, look at this. It showed me where the blood had dripped from the cow to about 10 feet away from it. There were shoe prints of blood in the road. It was just part of a shoe print, but you could tell that was a shoe print. We found two more when we looked more diligently. At this point, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up and it was suddenly a very cool evening. I looked at James and his eyes were as big as saucers. He thought something spooky was happening too. We talked about going back, but we knew that we'd be shamed if we didn't see if there was anything else. We finally decided to walk the bikes the rest of the way to the dead end just in case there was someone there. We didn't want them to hear the engines. We began walking the last quarter mile or so to the dead end. It was at the base of the last hill and we just started heading up onto the other side. My heart was going at about 200 miles per hour and I had cotton mouth so bad that it was almost impossible to swallow. Then I noticed that someone had stuck paper plates to the barbs of the wire on the fence. We looked and there were plates stuck to the top strand of a wire on both sides of the road. It started about 50 feet behind us, it continued up and over the hill. They were evenly spaced about 5 feet apart. As our gaze followed the row of paper plates up the top of the hill, James suddenly said, there's another fire, and it was at that moment that I could smell it. But what I smelled wasn't that normal smoky smell. It was as though someone had added incense into it. I asked James if he could smell that and he could. I told him that I didn't like this at all. I was okay with losing face in front of our friends and his dad and brothers. I was ready to go. He agreed with me but said that we had to see what was burning. We were both whispering and we were both shaking so much that our voices quivered. We started up the hill again and I was thinking with every step that we were going to be seriously killed or worse. As we got to the top of the hill, one of the paper plates blew off the fence and skittered behind us making both of us jump and it was all I could do to not scream. After I saw what it was, I started to laugh it off, but James shushed me and told me to listen. We could hear voices. As we topped the hill and were able to see the bottom where the road stopped, we saw a group of about 10 people all standing around another recliner that was burning. They had their backs to us and they were passing a big picture around. From our vantage point, we couldn't actually see what was in the picture, but the slit throat of the cow haunted my thoughts. They would each take a mouthful and spit it into the fire. This went on until the picture was empty. The entire time, they were all saying something in unison. We could only understand an occasional word. They changed their tones in a rhythmic manner with an emphasis in the last word. I can remember hearing here and there and beseech and father. James and I stood there on top of the hill like a couple of idiots. Our mouths hanging wide open and actually scared stiff. After a minute or two, they would repeat whatever it was, all the while passing around that pitcher and spitting it into the fire. There was a small camp table set up on the side and a little behind them. After the last of the liquid was gone, a man turned and sat the pitcher on the table and picked up what looked like a large loaf of bread. Just as he was turning back to the fire, he evidently saw us. I am sure that we made a nice silhouette sitting there at the top of the hill. He screamed hey and dropped the loaf of bread and started running in our direction. The others turned and immediately followed him. That was all the encouragement that we needed. It was time to go. We turned our bikes around. James got his started on the first kick, but I somehow managed to get myself off balance and when I kicked, the bike fell on its side with me. By this time, I was near panic and was breathing in raspy short breaths. 
I picked the bike up again and tried to start it, but it didn't start. I thought about running, but we were out in the middle of nowhere. I finally started pushing the motorcycle down the other side of the hill and jumped on it. It seemed like it took forever to get enough speed, but I popped the clutch and it started. James was waiting at the corner of the intersection to make sure that I was coming and we were headed for his house, going way too fast for safety, especially in the dark. When we finally got back to his house, we told his dad what we'd seen. His dad called a couple of friends and they all loaded up in their trucks with enough weapons to start a small war. James and I sat with his dad and told him where to turn. His dad kept asking us questions on the way. What were they doing? Why was there a chair on fire? They cut the cow's throat? How many were there? What did they look like? What were they driving? The last question stumped us. We hadn't seen any cars or trucks. The road was the only way in or out and there was a creek that ran on the back side of the end of that particular road so they couldn't have gone that direction. How did they get there with two recliners? When we got to that last stretch of road, the headlights found the spot where the recliner had been sitting. It was gone. We could all see where the road and surrounding grass was burned, but the recliner was not there. As we got closer, James noticed that the cow was gone too. I hate to admit, but I was getting scared all over again. I was afraid that his dad would tell us that it was our imagination and not believe us. When we got closer to the burnt spot in the road, Buster, James' dad, noticed the chair off in the ditch on the left side of the road. Then I noticed the cow on the other side. It was also in the ditch. The paper plates were all gone. Buster got out to look at the cow with the other men. They stood there talking and shaking their heads for what seemed like 10 minutes before getting back into the trucks. We continued toward the hill. The ruts made by spinning motorcycle tires were easily seen, but there was no fire on the other side of the hill. We all went down to where the other recliner had been burning, but it and the camp table were gone. You could see where someone had walked around the charred area and covered it with dirt. After we left, James saw a paper plate about 50 feet on the other side of the fence. Buster called the county sheriff when we got home, and by that time it was daylight and we went out again with the sheriff and a deputy. When we got back to the road, the first recliner and the cow were gone but you could still see where something had been on fire and there was still blood on the road and in the grass. James showed them the shoe prints we'd seen. At the bottom of the hill, you could still see the charred area where the second recliner had been burning and the deputy found the little scuff marks where the table had been sitting. At the end of the road, you could see where the top strand of the fence had been tugged down and wrapped around the lower strand so someone could crawl over it. You could also see where the grass and weeds had been trampled, providing a fairly easy trail to follow. We found a woman's tennis shoe on the other side of the creek. You could see where someone had climbed up the bank on the far side of the creek. We followed the trail all the way across the field up to the next dirt road. Again, the top wire was wrapped around the next lower wire and there was a piece of red bandana looking material caught in it. There were marks on the road where two or three different cars had spun their tires when they left. Buster also found a large piece of glass that had blood on it. Buster filed a report for the missing cow. They'd found four more cows in the opposite direction from where me and James had gone. They never found the recliners or the missing cow. The sheriff called a few days later and told Buster that the blood on the glass was human and not bovine. It was his guess that the pitcher broke and someone cut their hand while carrying it back to their vehicles. Two weeks after that, there was a huge scare in our community about some cult that had promised the area at large that they were going to kidnap someone and sacrifice them. Buster always said that it was just someone running their mouth after hearing about our incident. It was all anyone talked about that summer. Buster also said that he sure would like to know what happened to that cow. The story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, beating cougar and bear territory, knowing that I was very far away from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the last and national forest in northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long unkept beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say. 
I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately 5 feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed the food wasn't there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite and so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope from which the food was hanging. I thought of the couple I had passed earlier and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured the couple was simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than food. Several days passed and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal or otherwise. I awoke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to be silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent and was ready to slash at whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and opened my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence something had actually happened were the boot prints, the same as before. Several more days passed and I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 70 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front of me and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, screw this, this trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Castella located off I-5. The only problem was that it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent and tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sounds travel far in the absence of other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is screwed up. This is so screwed up. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing, and goes dark. I unzipped my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. Then I heard footsteps running towards the tent and barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately 5 minutes I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain they were gone but I didn't move. Eventually, birds started chirping and I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta, and spoke with the police and forest service. They put me in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there have been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing ever came of the couple. This happened in the fall of 1993, when I was 20 years old. In the interest of context, this was before I started college, and I was working in the material prep department of a plastics factory on the night shift. I was the only woman in the department, and my male co-workers were initially skeptical that I could handle the job, but I proved myself and earned their respect. It was hard work, but on the plus side, it also put me in the best shape of my life. I had just gotten off work, and it was about 1.30am. My car was running on fumes, so I stopped at a local gas station to fill up. While I was pumping gas, a woman about my age approached me looking nervous and scared. She said that she had been at her boyfriend's house, and they had a fight. She'd walk up to the gas station to use the payphone and call her to pick her up. On her way to the station, our car pulled up as she was walking and the guys inside started catcalling and harassing her. With a slight moving of her head, she indicated a car that was parked off to the side by the gas station dumpsters. I saw a large light green car, like a caddy or a Lincoln, with at least two or three shadowy figures inside. She said they threatened her and she was too scared to call her friend and wait. The woman was neat, well dressed, and didn't seem high or drunk or anything like that. She just seemed really nervous and freaked out, so I didn't even hesitate. I finished pumping my gas and told her to hop in the car, then I'd take her home. At that time on a weeknight, there was little traffic, so I booked it right out of the gas station and asked her where she lived. She kept twisting around in the seat to see if the car was behind us, 
and when I asked her to put her seatbelt on, she ignored me and kept looking for the car. I assumed she was just scared. A few blocks down the road, however, I noticed she was looking around the car, and she started asking me about the money. Where's your purse? Where's your bag? I need money. You need to give me some money. My stomach sank. I have this woman in my car, and now she's gonna rob me. But when I thought about it, robbery just didn't make much sense. I was driving a 1985 Chevette and was wearing my work clothes, a ratty t-shirt and jeans with combat boots. I did not look like a person with a lot of cash, primarily because I wasn't a person with a lot of cash. She twisted around in the seat again and started yelling, there they are, there they are. She didn't sound scared anymore. I checked the rear view and sure enough, the light green car is right behind me. She started cackling and bouncing up and down in the seat. My boys are gonna screw you up. They're gonna screw you up. She's laughing like crazy, opening the glove box, looking in the back for a bag or purse, telling me all the messed up things these guys are planning to do to me. Now, if I had been smart, I would have just driven to the police station. Actually, if I had been very smart, I would have just called the cops from the gas station and waited with her until they arrived. That would have been the intelligent thing to do. Unfortunately, none of this crossed my mind until later. In the moment, I just got really, really angry. I realized three key things all at once. There was an intersection up ahead, with cars on either side waiting to cross, and the light had just turned yellow. I had a spare box cutter that I kept for work in the driver's side door compartment. The lady still had it put on her seatbelt. I didn't think. I floored it and passed under the yellow light just as it turned red. I glanced back to see if the green car was still behind me, but the cross traffic at the intersection had started to move, and they had it caught up. The woman started yelling. I slammed on the brakes and she hit the dash and windshield with a solid and viciously satisfying crack. When she rebounded to the passenger seat, I had the box cutter in her face and was screaming some serious stuff. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was along the lines of, get out, get out of my car before I cut off your face and make you eat it. The crazy screaming and box cutter combo worked. She grabbed blindly at the handle and popped the door open, and I started shoving and punching her until she tumbled out the door to the curb. I stomped on the gas, got to the next turn, and squealed around it with the passenger door still open. I made a few more turns because I was afraid that the green car might catch up to me. After a little while, I stopped to close the passenger door, and then I cut across town and got onto the highway to go home. I was on the highway for about 5 minutes before the shake started. I pulled off to the shoulder to calm down and get my act together, and then I drove home. I told my older sister. I was living with her temporarily after the breakup with my ex. She grabbed me in a tight bear hug while simultaneously yelling about how stupid I was for not going to the police. I've never been so glad to be yelled at in my life. I've lived most of my life way out in the valley countryside of Ontario. Given, it's not a whole lot for an 18 year old, but for me it's the only place I can call home. And I like to think that I know the entire area, as far as sprawling that is, like the back of my hand. Adventures across the long, cross-crossing roads, pastures, and woods that made up the skeleton of my village were a common venture in my childhood. As a young kid, I had a habit of biking extremely far out in hopes of finding new places, and sometimes, my dad or one of my friend's parents would toss out bikes in their pickup and take us way out into a back road and let us explore for a few hours. This was how a lot of us first found that on one of these bad gravel roads surrounded by thin woods was a worn down old shack sitting just about 20 meters off of the path. Honestly, I never thought anything of it, except for the fact that it was creepy. It had no windows to see inside, and I never went anywhere near it. But one of my friends at the time said that her older sister had tried to go in it and that the door was always locked. We all had better things to do than to be curious about that at the time anyway. So I quickly moved on and became nothing more than a mundane landmark of that area. Honestly, I had completely forgotten about it for a few years now. Except last Tuesday. I was coming home from one of my very late classes at my university, and I usually take the back routes I used many years ago, as they're more straightforward and never have any sort of traffic. As I drove down the gravel path that would wind along the side of the country and eventually take me to the next street I needed to turn onto, I noticed a faint glinting coming from within the trees up ahead, maybe about 100 meters from my car. A flashlight? I thought, but as my car came closer, I realized what I was really seeing. The light inside of the shack was on. I should mention now that in all of the nearly 13 years I've spent living in my area, I have never seen that door open, and I've never seen a light on inside of that shack, ever. Not even once. I must have driven past that shack probably almost a hundred times in my life, but this was the first time I'd ever seen any sign of a person's presence having been anywhere near that thing. That, coupled with the fact that it was 10 o'clock at night and pitch black outside, aside from my own headlights, and the faint glow lighting up the door frame up ahead, immediately filled me with what I can only describe as a weird sense of dread. Fortunately, while my car approached the light, I was curious enough that despite the feeling in my stomach, I slowed down as I was about to pass, hoping that I could see what was going on inside, 
and this is probably the only reason I managed to spot the dark shape that burst out of the foliage on the side of the road, directly into my path. I wasn't going very fast at that point, but I still pounded the brakes rather hard in alarm, so my car came to a crunching stop on the gravel. For a moment, I was just really confused and freaked out. What was that? Had I almost hit a deer or something? This far out in the country, a deer would have been the most likely and most reasonable assumption. But in the beams of my car, I could see what had stopped me. A very tall, a very lanky old man with scraggly and balding gray hair. He looked dirty and unkempt, and as his clothes hung off of him, I felt extremely unsettled over what this guy could be doing way out here, and why he had walked out in front of my car. As I sat there confused, the old man came around to my window and knocked on the glass. I rolled down the window just a crack, only enough for someone to be able to hear me and for me to hear them. I was already creeped out enough as it was. Immediately, I had to say what I was thinking. What are you doing out here? In my peripheral vision, I could still see the light from the shack, but in my mind's eye, I wasn't really registering it anymore. Stupid, I know. I should have made the connection immediately, but I was still kind of shaken by the fact that I could have run this guy over if I hadn't been able to stop in time. And being a new driver and all, the thought of that was terrifying. After a small pause, the man started talking to me. He had a thick, croaky sort of voice and he spoke very slowly. My truck, it's broken, he explained. Oh, okay. I was also getting the feeling that he wasn't really all there, mentally. I didn't have to look around to notice there wasn't any truck on the side of the road, but I did anyway, turning my head around to confirm what I already knew. There was definitely no truck. Had he somehow driven it into the trees or something? As far as I can remember and see, there wasn't enough space anywhere in them for a truck to fit through. What was the man talking about? While I was looking, it was honestly as though I could feel that he was watching me, and when I turned back, he was still leaning down to peer inside of my window at me. Where? I don't see it. I was definitely distrustful of this guy already. At first, he didn't respond, and my nerves were only getting worse the longer we were alone out here. Then he replied, it's just up the road, he said, turning just to point with his finger in that general direction. The lights on my car aren't exactly the greatest, but I could still see far enough that I really couldn't imagine where on earth this truck was supposed to be. I couldn't spot the faintest sight of it. While I squinted up ahead, he continued, I'll show you where, if you come. At this point, I really had no idea what this old man was thinking I could do to help. I'm just an 18 year old girl. I don't exactly look like the type of person who knows a lot about cars or how to fix them. And for the record, I'm really not. But I was tired from a long day at school, so I absolutely was not at my brightest. And for some reason, a part of me felt guilty about leaving him out here alone if his truck really was broken. Okay, I said, and I reached to my gear shift to start driving slowly up the road. But as soon as he saw my hand, he shook his head. Just walk, it's not too far. What? Excuse me, but no thanks. How was I going to see anything in the dark if I got out of my car and followed him anyway? There was no harm in driving wherever he was trying to lead me. The more I talked to the guy, the more unnerved I was getting, and the more red flags were starting to pop up in my mind. I couldn't see a car anywhere, and this total stranger wanted me to get out of mine and follow him into the dark on this creepy road in the middle of nowhere. Uh, no. I'd rather drive to it, I responded. I could see his brow furrow, and he looked kind of agitated. He insisted, your car won't fit in the trees anyway. So did his truck crash then? Why the trees, if we were going up the road? I remembered what I'd just been thinking a minute earlier about there not being enough space, and I asked him, then how did yours get in the trees? The only logical explanation would have been that his truck had swerved off the road, but even if that were the case, there was seriously nothing at all that I could have done to help him fix his car or get it back out again. The entire situation was beginning to make me very scared. There was a lengthy enough pause between my question and him speaking up that I was beginning to think that he didn't hear me or something. So I asked again, still no immediate answer. When he finally did reply, he was staring at me directly in the eyes. You really don't look old enough to drive. I hear comments like this a lot, since I do look very young because of my size. Normally, somebody would say this with a smile or something to signify that this is, in fact, meant to be taken as a joke. But this guy's face didn't change even slightly. He just kept staring at me with a completely cold expression. That type of a remark in this kind of situation immediately had my heart racing. And all I could think was, what did this guy want from me? What I wanted to say next was, well, who are you? But instead, I anxiously fumbled for my phone in my pocket, babbling in a way that probably made it really obvious that I was completely freaked out of my mind. Uh, okay, I could just call someone to come help you out. There's not really anything I can do. As I said that it occurred to me to wonder, did this old guy not have a cell phone of his own? I know not every older person has one, even if they're becoming much more common, but seriously. And then I also remembered, with a sudden streak of massive fear, the shack with the light on. 
I could still see the light coming from it just up ahead in the trees. My dumb brain finally put two and two together. The old man hadn't even mentioned it at all. It was like it wasn't even there to him, and there was definitely no one out there that could have turned the light on but the guy who was just standing outside my car right now. What was he doing out here in the shack then, which had been locked for all these years by someone I never knew? There was definitely no truck around here. He wanted me out of my car for a whole nother reason. I think maybe the old man must have seen on my face that I was scared out of my wits and about to book it out of there. Instead of any words, without warning, his face contorted with rage, and he swung his fist, pounding against it my window with enough strength to make it shudder. His eyes were wide and he looked furious and completely insane. Even though I was panicking more than I ever had in my life, and I was sure he was about to smash the window in if he tried again, I screamed, threw my phone onto the floor, switched gears, and slammed my foot down on the gas pedal. I hurtled down the road, and when I glanced into my rearview mirror, I saw his dark shape turn from standing in the road, and I watched as he turned, and he walked off the road, directly back towards the light of the shack. I didn't slow down at all until I was nearly home, and absolutely sure that there was no way that he could have followed me. When I got home that night, I spent a long time crying about what had happened with my mom. And though I don't think she believed all of what I told her, we don't have the greatest relationship, she called up everyone she knew to ask if anyone knew the old man, or if they knew who owned that shack. In a town like ours, just about everyone knows each other, but no one had any clue who he was. One of our family friends even swore that he was sure it's been abandoned for at least four years now. And since most people don't usually take that road, no one said that they've ever seen a light on or the door open but me. I've been taking a different route home from school since, and I really don't think I ever want to head back down that road. Creepy guy in the shack, please, let's not meet again. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, the student community at UCSB, notorious for being a party school. It fully lived up to its reputation. I liked to party, but wow, these people were off the wall. As such, there were a lot of people who put themselves in dangerous situations. Drinking to excess, not being careful, not locking doors, etc. It had a very isolated and insular vibe, and anyone who was hanging around who wasn't college-aged immediately looked at a place and strange. One night after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with two other girls, probably around 2.30 a.m. We were all serious students, I was probably the least serious actually, and we partied and it was not your typical UCSB mega rager, more like a small get together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep in our furniture, or in our beds as this case may be. That night my roommates had a few people over who I didn't know, and I saw when I returned home that one of them had opted to sleep on the couch from the shadow that I saw there. I didn't turn the light on so I wouldn't wake anyone up. But as I was passing the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed that the figure was lying very stiff. He just had this weird energy to him. He was lying down, but it was like he was putting all of his energy into lying as still and rigid as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me, without moving his limbs. So quickly that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark. Figuring that I'd startled him, or that he was drunk, or maybe on some kind of stimulant and unable to sleep, I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. The dude made me so nervous, and I wasn't taking any chances. I fell asleep. At 4.30 AM, I woke up. There was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood very quietly. I lay still and listened. There were more quiet sounds like someone scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder until it was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and as hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I got my cell phone and texted my roommate because I was afraid to make a sound. Your friend is freaking me out. Is he coked out? Can you talk to him? He's banging and scratching on my door. She didn't text me back, probably because she was asleep. I texted my other roommate to the same effect, covering all of my bases. Keep in mind that the scratching has been going on at this point for a couple minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it. Scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel good. He also grabbed at the knob and jiggled it super forcefully. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and really wake them up, though I was scared to make a sound. I know it sounds stupid, but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to terrify me. I felt like a little kid, but I could tell this guy was screwed up or something and maybe the police needed to be called, and I wanted to loot my roommates in since it was one of their friends. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate, who answered sleepily. Yo, your friend is messed up, can you please deal with it? Do we need to call the cops? He's seriously scaring me and he was scratching at my bedroom door. He's really weird. She didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she did speak, her voice had no sleepiness in it at all. What friend, she said. That guy that was sleeping on the couch, I said. 
She was quiet again. We didn't have any guys over, she said. Call the police. My adrenaline surged and I told her to please lock the bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I hadn't heard scratching in a while and I had no clue where the dude had gone. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging in the other end of the house, where my roommates, Lauren and Monica, shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of them screaming in fear. I quickly dialed the police as this maniac proceeded to bang against the, luckily, locked bedroom door of my two roommates as they screamed. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the door down. I told the 911 operator the situation and she dispatched two squad cars. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to peeling drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawls. This was really serious and strange and I think the dispatcher got the sense from my tone how terrified I was. She stayed on the phone with me. At one point the banging stopped and everything was quiet for a while. I talked with the dispatcher and suddenly looked down to see that this guy had slipped his fingers through the one inch gap between my door and the floor was just kind of waggling them around, making this weird growling sound. I screamed and backed away, which is my biggest regret about the situation. Since when I look back at it, it would have been so awesome to just stomp his fingers and hear the guy howl in pain. When the cops rolled up, I heard running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing, and then he was gone. The cops never caught him. He had broken in through our side door by jimmying the lock somehow. My door was covered in what turned out to be huge gashes he'd made using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me the most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realized now that he was not trying to sleep or on drugs, but was lying so stiff like that because he was hiding. He probably heard me open the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized there was another girl living there and tried to blend into the couch in the darkness. The story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I'm a USAF Security Forces Airman, military police. My girlfriend was at work, and as a sweltering hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods, and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat, and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange. It was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the aspen grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5'5". Five five. Regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would not have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out, I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area, but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it, all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp, should we need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over, no fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. 
Let's go. Let's get out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the woman's clothing were all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area and do not intend to. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Okay, so I've had a few issues with my next door neighbor since I moved in, but nothing creepy until just recently. There was a man, a woman, and at least one boy living there, and I mostly just avoid them. The man seems okay but a bit weird, and the boy just keeps to himself, and the woman is quite a bit off. Not long after we moved in, she left a note in my mailbox. Our mailboxes are right beside each other, between our houses. Anyway, I stood at the mailbox reading the note. She thought that my dog was using the bathroom in her yard. It was possible, as our friends had some holes in it, that our dog had gotten out then. But those holes had been fixed a long time ago. Still, no big deal, except I noticed her standing in her driveway, just staring at me. And the note was very long, I just kept reading it. The more I read it, the crazier it got, and the weirder her behavior in my peripheral vision became. Apparently I was… entitled. She seemed to think I was somehow instructing my dog to use the bathroom in the yard. Her note went on a tangent about how awful dogs are. She was also 100% convinced it was my dog, even though there are always tons of loose dogs, cats, and wildlife wandering around and no doubt traveling through her unfenced backyard. In my peripheral vision, she got into her SUV, backed out of her driveway, then parked it along the street directly behind me and just idled there, staring. The note then went on a weird, long tirade about the previous family to live in my house, saying I was Anther Deb as if I'd have any idea at all what that is even supposed to mean, then concluded in some odd insults and some implied not quite threats. This is the closest thing we ever had to a conversation at this point. I can understand not wanting a dog using the bathroom in her yard, but this was a bit of an extreme reaction as this was literally the first time I'd even heard of there being a problem. A simple note would have done, but this note was insane. She was still staring behind me. I decided to try to ignore her and just go to my house. That's when she shouted out her window, are you playing a game? The reaction made no sense. Are you nuts? I replied, as I officially ran out of patience. She shouted more nonsense and insults at me while blocking my driveway, which is right next to the mailboxes, with her vehicle, while I repeatedly told her to leave before I called the cops. This went back and forth like this for a while, but she eventually sped off when I pulled my cell phone out. Later, my boyfriend, who had not been home at this time this happened, had a chat with the neighbors. He said they seemed agreeable and reasonable and basically dismissed me of just being dramatic. The woman told a very different version of events, of course. I was annoyed that my boyfriend wasn't taking me seriously, but let it go. I think he just wanted to keep getting along with the man next door, as they sometimes borrow tools. They speak to him a lot differently than how they speak to me. They don't do anything rude to me while he's around. In fact, they don't speak to me when he's around at all. They always wait for him to be away. Anyway, I mostly just avoid them. Sometimes, the woman stares at me, but I just ignore her. Until recently, I have been mostly successful. Here's the creepy story. I don't sleep well at night when I'm home alone, and I'm always home alone now because my boyfriend is out of the country on business for months at a time. I often feel like there's someone just outside my house or at my door. Sometimes, my dogs act up at odd hours, but I never see anyone. I keep my house alarm armed and my pistol in my nightstand. The other night was one such night. I didn't sleep well and kept having a sinking feeling that something was wrong. Anyway, I got out of bed at about 2am because I thought I was scheduled to work at 3am. I had mostly given up on getting a restful sleep then anyway. As I left my house, I heard something to my left, the direction of my neighbor's house, but didn't see anything. I was always nervous in my driveway because the motion sensor light was broken, but there was always a lot of darkness between my door and my truck, so I always moved quickly to my driveway. I got in my truck and went to work. It turned out that I misread my schedule and didn't work at 3 that morning after all. Annoyed at the mistake, but grateful I'd get to go home and sleep a little more before the actual start of my shift at 7, I went home. I pulled into my driveway and didn't see anything in the beam of my truck's headlights. 
I always look around my truck before getting out. I turned the headlight off and got out. I took a few steps ahead of my truck, and then all of a sudden a large man called out to me, shouted really, from the shadows at the corner of my house. He scared me so bad that I screamed, reached for my pepper spray, and fell down. Not useful. He apologized in a tone that didn't sound sorry at all. It was my neighbor, and that wasn't much of a relief. Apparently it was my fault that he occasionally found trash in his yard, in Windy, Colorado. Complaining about this seemed to be a lot more important issue than scaring the heck out of me while I'm alone at night. He showed no real concern or realization that was even wrong at all. Again, I have no problem with neighbors bringing issues to my attention, but seriously, hey, can you make sure trash from your bins isn't blown into my yard is not a question that takes 10 minutes nor is it one that needs to be addressed at 3 in the morning. I'm not in agreement to keep the peace, but I know the trash isn't mine. We live in a windy area. Trash gets blown around in people's yards all the time. No big deal. But he would just not stop going on about it. He kept needlessly repeating himself and made some not quite but kind of threat about getting along. Think about the lines of, it would be a shame if something were to happen, type sort of threats. He was keeping me busy. I didn't even notice his wife flank me. Before I even knew she was there, she appeared from the shadows by a tree. She wanted to yell at me about some eggs. A few weeks ago, I found a bunch of eggs smashed on the road near our shelled mailbox. As the carton was right next to them, I thought the carton had obviously just been dropped. Not that someone was trying to egg anything. I assumed my neighbor had dropped the eggs on her way to get the mail and just left them. She denies this, but I still think that's the most likely explanation because no one else has any reason to be out at our mailbox with eggs. But I didn't care enough to say anything to her about it at the time, so I just let it go and forgot all about it. Now she was accusing me of leaving eggs around, again, inexplicably expressing the grievance at 3am. Weird that she hadn't brought it up weeks ago when it happened, but I know why she didn't. My boyfriend was still here then. My boyfriend has been away on business for several weeks now, long enough for them to have noticed his absence. They were also probably aware that my motion sensor light was out. They sure seemed to know how to avoid my headlight beams. Being surprisingly patient, I explained that I knew nothing about the eggs. I mentioned that I later found a lot of the shells in my yard and figured a squirrel must have carried them there. She proudly informed me that she tossed them onto my yard herself. Apparently she thought that was okay, but someone dropping them in the first place isn't. Anyway, this is where I started to get over my shock a bit and started getting pissed. Initially, I had been somewhat relieved that the man in the shadows had been my neighbor, not some random crazy person, but now I was pissed. I had now been outside with them for like 20 minutes, while they accused me about stupid stuff. While well, I tried to be polite and agreeable even though I had nothing to do with it, but now everything wrong with the situation had just kicked in. I eventually remembered that I don't actually have to put up with any of this and cut her off mid rant and said, it's 3am, I'm going home, Good night," and turned on my heel. I heard her say something in an unkind tone as I left, but didn't catch what it was. They had staked out my house, waited for my boyfriend to leave, and long enough to be sure he was gone. All to complain about some insane stuff long after it supposedly even happened. If they have concerns, surely there are better times to address them than at 3am. What were they doing out at 3am anyway? And that man had totally purposely hidden a shadow at the corner of my house where he could avoid my headlights and didn't reveal himself until I was out of my truck and exposed. And shouldn't the woman have walked up beside her husband, not gone around while I was distracted? They kept doing odd behavior, never enough that they're doing anything illegal or anything to report to police, but none of this is normal behavior. Honestly, I think these complaints are just excuses and they're really just taking the opportunity to intimidate me. I think they're messing with me on purpose. Then again, I could be wrong. Either way, I will be installing a motion light soon. I was so shaken up and had my adrenaline so high from someone scaring me from a blind spot by my house. Because seriously, that could have been someone else and a whole lot worse. The story starts several years ago. Me and my friends' interest in urban exploration. I was a junior in high school at the time, which was when everyone started to earn a lot more freedom, so we took the chance to be out late whenever we could. Now, keep in mind that I live in a major city in central Colorado, so the nightlife is never lacking. We could always find something to do, and were especially drawn if there was an element of danger. We wouldn't always plan these trips, but we made sure that if we were going into any old building in the dark, we would have a knife and a flashlight for safety. We never really had to defend ourselves, but we came very close one evening. It must have been around November, because there wasn't yet snow on the ground, but it was actually a chilly evening. Directly across the street from the abandoned hospital, which we have hypothesized is still around from the TB area, is a hospital that is newer and in use. The two are connected by an underground tunnel, which I can only assume was a way to move bodies without alerting the patients. 
We had been inside the hospital a few times, but never found anything strange, only the occasional sign of others having been or lived there. What was piquing our interest that night was the abandoned library next door to the hospital. It was connected, but only by exterior walls. To get inside, you could not cut through the hospital, but instead had to hop over a tall wall and climb a very high fence. A few of us had backpacks, containing the aforementioned safety precautions and a couple bottles of water. So, nothing too heavy or valuable that would get damaged when tossed over the obstacles before us. A little ways off the road, it was dark if you clung to the buildings. We did for a while before stepping behind a small patch of shrubbery, which we determined was an easy way over the first wall since the other way around to gain access was by a chained, unclimbable gate at the bottom of a set of stairs facing away from the ledge. Both were parallel with the library, so when tucked back in that corner behind the bushes, no one could see us from the street. I don't believe I went first, but I did not remain behind to be last over that wall. It was too high up for me to jump and haul myself over so I resorted to stepping on a pipe jutting out somewhere lower along the wall. It gave me a bit of a needed boost, and soon I was up and over, moving into the library's courtyard. Another girl and I waited for our two other girlfriends to join us. Upon an initial glance over at the courtyard, there was no obvious way in. To our right was a dilapidated fountain, which I took joy in imagining spring forward a spray of water from its detailed stonework in the brighter summer months, people laughing and talking with the surrounding trees bringing them shade. Now, however, it had been in long disuse, and the earth at our feet was cold and hard. There were no signs of another soul for years, save the 15 chain link fence directly in front of us separating the courtyard in half. I could tell it hadn't seen the same weather as the rest of the courtyard, because the metal showed no signs of rust. That must be our way in, we agreed, because with a fence like that, someone obviously wanted to keep us out. We hurled our bags over the fence, hearing them clank on the ground rather silently due to their lightness. I was the third over, because of a slight fear of climbing and it took me a bit to mentally prepare myself. I made it to the top of the fence in short time, then sat at the top straddling it with a leg on either side. I had two girls on the other side in front of me, and one behind me who was telling me to hurry up. I spent a good couple minutes up there doing another mental preparation and some deep breathing, then climbed down to wait for the last girl. At the time, I was thinking that had been one of the scariest things I've done in a while, because I tend to avoid climbing at all costs. Of course, this is an irrational fear, as I have never fallen, but that phobic fear didn't even compare to what happened next. The last girl's feet hit the ground and all four of us split up into the smaller half of the courtyard, looking for any kind of entrance. We decided that breaking a window would be too loud and draw unwanted attention, not to mention we could really get cut up, so that wasn't an option. Searching for a little longer, we didn't find anything that looked remotely plausible, until we found a grate near the base of where two walls met. I couldn't believe we hadn't noticed it before, and upon closer inspection, the grate was already moved slightly from its resting place, so it would be easy to lift the rest of the way. The smallest and least fearful of our group went first. After moving the grate, there was a small drop down. It was no more than three feet down and two feet wide, but inside, there was another drop down where we could see into the library basement. She hopped down into the small, square landing, only to almost immediately freeze. We looked amongst ourselves, wondering what was wrong. There's a guy down there, she said. What? Where? I could see his outline, she said. I leaned forward and tried to make out a shape, but it was further down than my line of sight and it was too dark. Hello, she called out. He responded the same, asking who we were. Just a couple of chicks, she spat out bluntly. What he said next sent chills down my spine. It was as if I could feel the darkness radiating out of the hole in the ground. All of a sudden, it was very still and quiet, like the darkness had spilled out and weighed all of us down in that gloomy courtyard. He said in what I can only describe as a lustful tone gripping with ill intent. I'm addicted to following the sound of women's voices. My friend looked over at us blankly, but there was nervousness underneath. Unease. Something in his voice sounded like it wasn't an empty threat, like he wasn't just saying something creepy to get us to leave. She looked back to where he was and said slowly, that's not cool. The man under that dark earth began laughing maniacally, and not in the kind of way a really good actor does, and the way that we could feel his utter insanity hit us like stale air. We looked at each other for what felt like hours in that gloomy courtyard, but I knew it was only a couple seconds, because we all exchanged without even speaking that we had to get out of there, and now. I was not about to risk some crazy guy coming after us, even if we did outnumber him. The friend scrambled up out of the landing, and I was never over a fence faster in my life. 15 foot potential fall, and I didn't even have time to think about it. We didn't stop running until we were on the street and halfway down the block out of breath. So guy that was down there, let's not meet again. It was 2012 and my best friend Hannah had convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. 
She had, after searching for the longest time, found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 km to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a secondhand door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and I must admit I didn't share her obsession with it. But with her being the closest thing to a sister that I will ever get, I was happy to join her nonetheless. Hannah and I have always had each other, from the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we have traveled the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21 and had recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her the car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umeo when we arrived shortly before lunchtime and it started to snow heavily. The first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country live a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so nothing strange with that really. But still, there was something about him that made me uneasy. He was nice though, smiling and waving to us, shaking hands with us both before walking us around the car and pointing all the tiny little flaws. He showed us the work he had done on the car and showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs. He made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything. On the contrary, he made a show out of being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified and we were getting cold. He opened the car door for us and said, I got the paperwork at home. Let's close the deal over some coffee. Against all my instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us other than the alarm bells going off inside my head. I can't tell what it was that made me feel that way, but there must have been some sign that something was wrong, something that my subconscious tuned to. The man was constantly talking. He showed the stereo, told us about the features of the car, about the places we drove past, about the wildlife and the nature. There was not a silent moment. After about 20 minutes, I started to notice that we were in no way moving in the direction of civilization. Instead, it seemed we were driving further and further into the vast wilderness. It struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, diving us into unknown territory and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah who was happily listening to the man telling stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look at all worried. Maybe I was totally overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break maybe. This truly is very different Sweden compared to the city. The car finally stopped outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses apart from a small cabin that we drove past a few hundred meters down the road, but it had looked empty. We followed the man inside. He was still talking non-stop and continued to do so until the moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right. I'll put the kettle on, he said, and as he passed us to go into the kitchen, he let his hand touch Hannah's hair and he smiled smugly. May I use the bathroom? I asked politely and made my way to the door with a little red heart on. I was washing my hands when I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something was behind the water cistern. I pulled out a rolled up plastic folder and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. It was very violent pictures that looked like had been cut out from magazines, and they were glued to the paper. Surrounded by cut up pieces of handwritten text, put it together made a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy the car cheaply, and then it quickly turned into a horror story. I knew this will sound silly, but when we traveled together, Hannah and I had a code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of a situation. We had never needed to use it, just joked about it, but now it came in handy. I walked out of the bathroom and looked at Hannah and said, Potatoes. You forgot to buy potatoes. And that's too bad, because we really need some. The look on my face must have told her that the situation was no joke and she said, Oh, should we get some as soon as possible? The sooner the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen, tapped his shoulder and said, Excuse me, but I was wondering if I can go have a quick look at the cam belt. He upped something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We got into the car and speeded off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left the car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he reported it stolen? It would be embarrassing to explain to the police. But nothing happened. He didn't follow us, didn't report it. We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home, and we didn't want to linger closer to the airport in case he came looking for us. Later Hannah asked what made me use the code word, and I told her about what I had found. It might have just been a fantasy, a sick game, and maybe he would never done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would have died if we didn't get out. I'm glad Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just the code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, about how we would handle a situation where we need to get out fast, things would have ended differently. Both of us knew that either of us ever used the code word, it's time to get out, no questions asked, just move. This happened to me two years ago. It was my first month on the job and I worked night security at this pretty interesting place. I'm a 38 year old male. I've worked security jobs most of my life in the graveyard shift. I was an event security guard for various well-known concert venues for years. 
So, I've seen my fair share of strange things and crazy people. The place I currently work is a resort-style apartment complex. To get the layout, there are three floors of apartments with 50 units on each floor. This place takes up one city block with a golf course in the back, indoor swimming pools, hot tubs, and a small movie theater. You name it, this place has it. Most of the residents are retired doctors, lawyers, and otherwise rich. There are some younger people that live here as well, stockbrokers, and real estate agents and so on. Some just use their apartment in the summer and leave as soon as the snow falls. It is located in a well-known tourist town in the United States. The building itself has 12 exits on the first floor. The doors are locked at 11pm. You can exit, but you can't get back in unless you go to the front of the building and ask to be buzzed in or pick up the call box phone next to whatever exit you are at. It will ring the company's cell phone and I answer and can come let you in. The front lobby is set up much like a hotel, with sliding glass doors which I lock when I start my shift. In the middle of the building on first floor are two big slider doors which I also lock. They lead to the private parking lot. The parking lot itself is gated and you need a code to get in. This was midsummer, and while it's never really hot here, tonight was an exception. It was still very warm after the sun had set. I came in 10 minutes to 11 to start my shift. We have a routine to hand off the keys, event log, and phone to the next person on duty. Despite its size, I am the only security person here at night. A co-worker who was leaving told me the side iron gates that led to the parking lot are open on one side because they are stuck. This is nothing new and they often do get jammed. She told me the repair people would be in tomorrow, sometime to fix them but to do just some extra patrol out here tonight. This place sits across the road from a public park and while the area is pretty decent, the park tends to bring in homeless at night who sometimes like to try and wander on the property or cause trouble. My night started out as uneventful. As a security guard in this place, we only have pepper spray, a large flashlight, keys, and a company cell phone to call 911 if need be. We are told not to confront with bodily harm, nor can we detain anyone. We are simply eyes and ears and to call the police if something comes up. Of course, you can defend yourself if you need to, but in all cases if you are in danger, call the police is the company policy. Basically, I am to walk the grounds and floors for anyone suspicious, watch the cameras in the security office which is in the lobby, and otherwise try to stay alert. If a resident calls for a maintenance request, I would take the information down in the computer for a day shift, or if a resident called with a security issue, I would attend to it. Pretty easy enough job, I thought. I locked the doors to the parking lot and the lobby doors. I did a sweep of all the floors and then found myself back at the desk. It was really quiet and it rolled around to 3am. I had just sat down to eat my food when the company's cell phone rang. The caller ID let me know it was from one of our outside call box phones. I picked it up and said, thanks for calling, resort name here. This is security officer James, how can I help you? All I heard was someone breathing heavy. I glanced at the cameras and could see the shadow of a figure standing just out of reach from the door and camera view. All I could see is the open call box and the metal cord from the phone. I again asked how can I help. The man started to breathe heavier and laughed in silence. I got up from my chair and started to walk out of the office into the door he was at when it rang again, this time from call box number 2 which was further down. I quickly looked at the camera and saw this large figure in a hooded jacket. I knew this was strange as it was very warm outside. He was holding a black bag in his hands but had his back to the camera. I'm coming for you, they said in this raspy, deep tone. He hung up before I had the chance to say anything. Then the phone rang again. This time I picked up and before he could speak, I let him know the cops are on their way and to leave the property now as he is on camera. He tried the doors and both were locked. This time he was at yet another call box. The guy had to be running at top speed to make it to the next and the next call box as they were a good distance between doors on the outside. I can see you, the cops won't make it much here in time, they said. I spoke loud and pretended like I was talking to another security officer and asked him to send three other security guards to such and such location and that police are dispatched. The guy slammed the phone down loud against the call box receiver and I watched him on camera take off into the darkness of the park area. I figured it scared him off. I was going to call the police but honestly the location of this place it would take them at least 15 minutes to get here and I figured this guy was just some homeless guy from the park. I scanned the cameras and walked the back lot just to be sure no one was there. I had my pepper spray in my hands just in case but no one was out there. I returned to my desk and wrote what happened in the incident log. But a half hour passed, I had finished my food and was just about to do rounds when the phone rang again. This time it was from an unknown number. I thought it would be a resident calling for a repair issue or something. I picked up and said my normal line then I heard, Where are the cops? I don't see them but I see you, the voice said. It was that guy again. I scanned the cameras and did not see anything. I went to the front door to look out there. There was nothing but darkness and a few front floodlights on. I know you're alone, he said. I basically told him to get screwed and hung up. I called the non-emergency number to 911 and let them know what was going on. The dispatcher said she would send out a car to check the area and make contact with me. The next thing I hear is a loud thud against the glass windows to the day manager's office. 
which sits across from the security room. Another three loud bangs. I run to the door and unlock it. I pull up the shades and shine my flashlight through the window into the darkness. I catch the face of this hooded man. He looked to be about 40 with long, stringy hair poking down in these wild eyes. He looked right at me and grinned before slamming his head into the window to try and break it. I started yelling at him and told him the cops are coming and to get out of here. That's when he pulled the biggest butcher knife I've ever seen and make a slicing motion like he would use it to cut my throat. The guy was crazy. He continued slamming his body against the glass trying to break it. He used his head to try and break the window but managed to bust his head open, so the window now had blood all over it. I backed out of the office and locked the door to it. I then decided to wait for cops as this guy was out of control and my pepper spray wasn't going to stop him and the last thing I wanted was to handle a bloody crazy person. He then ran to the nearest side door and took the call box phone off the hook. He then ran to each call box and removed all the phones which caused my company's cell phone to ring and jam up the line. This guy had to be on something because he ran as fast as I could imagine. I watched the camera and noticed to my horror, the sliding door to the garage was open. Now it was common for residents to go out to their cars and unlock the doors themselves. It's just a sliding lock like the kind in department stores but this is the last thing I need with this guy running around. I sprinted across the building and took a shortcut through a couple banquet rooms to make it to the garage. As I was doing so, I saw that crazy guy running up the garage pathway. I slid that door as fast as I could and locked it before he got to the entryway. He then slammed his body into the glass, over and over, but the door did not move. I locked the second set of doors in case he got through the outside ones, he would at least be trapped or slow him down. I reached for my pepper spray, thinking maybe he would just leave and yell the cops are here. He started to laugh and howl and then held that knife up again before running to the darkness of the parking garages. I called the cops on my personal cell phone to let them know that the man has a knife. The dispatcher told me the cops will be there shortly and I let her know what happened. I made my way to the front again and locked myself in the security office. At least this place had no windows and I could watch on camera. I heard another loud thud and bang and realized he was at the front lobby doors trying to get in. I was hoping the cops would roll up any minute, but they didn't, and while it probably didn't take them long, it felt like forever at this point. The guy was standing at the lobby doors with a knife in hand. He faced the camera, and by this time his hood had fallen back. He was bald headed with wild, long, stringy hair on the sides of his head. His eyes were huge and I will never forget that grin on his face as he mouthed to the camera, die die, while making stabbing motions with that knife. Blood running across his face from slamming it into the glass, he then ran out into the darkness. About 5 minutes later the cops show up. They sent one officer. He asked me what the guy looks like and I told him I have camera footage. He drove through the area first and shined a spotlight. The cop returned to tell me he couldn't find anyone and he had driven around the entire block and back area behind the golf course. I showed him the footage and printed out a picture from the camera. The cop said he didn't see any sign of the guy and that he would patrol the area and to call back if he came again. It was now nearly 5am when the cop left. I waited until 6am when it was daylight and the people were starting to get out and about before I walked around and hung up all the phones from the call boxes. This guy literally took all the 12 phones off the hook. When my manager came in during the morning shift at 8am, I told her what happened and she said that they would keep an eye out and have a meeting to let everyone know who worked here know and to be aware. They had an extra security guard on my shift for 2 weeks after but the guy never returned. The cops never found the guy or who he was. So crazy bloody guy with a knife, let's not meet again. A couple of summers ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in Chiquamigan National Forest in northern Wisconsin, and after our experience, we do not plan to return unless we go with a large group of people. My girlfriend and I are from college, so northern Wisconsin was our go-to place for R&R. &R. We've done a number of hiking trips in northern Wisconsin and in the UP, but never to this area. We are not backpacking experts, but we have been to a number of national parks and have been out hiking and exploring when we can find the time away from work. We love getting away from people and relaxing in nature, but this trip made us appreciate the presence of other people around us in unfamiliar places. Our plan was to hike a remote section of the North Country Trail. The North Country Trail is a national scenic trail, like the Appalachian Trail, but it gets much less use. In some parts of northern Wisconsin, the trail is very remote, and the only access is via logging roads. We planned to hike 15 miles along the trail to a backpack shelter, spend the night, and hiked back to the car the following day. We spent the night at a friend's house in Wausau, and we set out early the next day to the trailhead. As we entered the national forest boundary, we were captivated by the beauty of the thick green forest. I drove slowly along the gravel logging roads as we made our way to our own parking spot. While we were driving to the trailhead, we passed a couple of people standing next to a parked truck on the side of the road. They appeared to be campers, as they had a rusted out, bunged up pickup truck. As we drove past, I waved, and they stared back without returning the greeting. Friendly people, I thought to myself. After we passed them, I looked in the rearview mirror and noticed they were still staring at us. 
and before we rounded a bend, I glanced back into the mirror again and saw them watching us through the haze of road dust. My girlfriend and I joked about the up north people, but we did not think anything of the encounter. Aside from those people, we did not encounter anyone else on the remote logging roads within the National Forest boundary. We found the trailhead about 15 minutes later after winding our way on the narrow logging road. There was no one else parked at the trailhead, a perfect chance to get some needed solitude, fresh air, and relaxation. After parking and making sure the car was locked, we hoisted our packs and set off on the trail. The weather was relatively cool, which thankfully kept the mosquitoes and biting flies at bay. We took pictures along the way, and we marveled at the lushness of the forest and the topography of the glacial moraine. After a solid 8 hours of hiking, we found our campsite. It consisted of a wooden backpack shelter and a fire ring. Even though the shelter provided ample space for us, we opted to set up our tent in a small clearing about 100 feet behind the shelter. We built a fire at the shelter fire ring, and I boiled water for our dehydrated trail food. As we ate, we watched the sky slowly turn dark. My girlfriend and I passed around a Nalgene filled with wine, and we marveled at how many stars you could see away from the city. When the fire was reduced to a small pile of glowing embers, we decided to head back to our tent. We settled into our tent and looked through the pictures we took that day, but after lugging a heavy pack for 15 miles and drinking some wine, I was ready for some shut-eye. When we camped at state and national parks, I usually wore earplugs, but that night, there were no RVs or other campers to make noise, so I closed my eyes and let the noise of the forest lull me to sleep. My girlfriend was very uneasy that night, but she normally had some apprehension whenever we were sleeping away from home. I'm not sure when we drifted to sleep, but we awoke to a bone chilling noise. It was pitch dark outside, and over the insects in the forest, I heard a dull thud. It sounded like someone was hitting two logs together. My girlfriend and I were wide awake at this point, and we lay silently in our tent, hearing the noise again. Our old tent had mesh windows, but the backpacking tent we were using had no window. We could only guess at what was making the sound outside of our tent. We initially thought that an animal had got our food and garbage bag, which we left in the shelter, but the noise was too distinct, and it did not sound like rustling through food wrappers or our camp equipment. Our hearts were pounding as we heard the persistent knock in the darkness. Unarmed and scared, we did not know what to do. I would normally have carried a can of bear spray, but I decided to leave it at home to save on weight, against the wishes of my girlfriend. The knocking continued but we remained still as to not give away our location. For all we knew, whatever was making the noise had already spotted our tent. After what seemed like an eternity, the knocking sound ceased. We lay in complete silence with only the dull buzz of the insects in the background. Then we heard it, leaves rustling, a branch breaking, voices. We heard low talking in the distance. We could not make out what was being said, but it sounded like a couple of people talking in the distance. The voices continued for a bit, but to our relief, the voices did not seem to be getting louder. Whoever was out there did not spot the tent or decided to leave us alone. We sat in our tent for the rest of the night, adrenaline surging through our veins. At the first light, we slowly got out of our tent. I looked around in all directions to see if anyone was out there, but I only saw the forest and the backpack shelter. We quickly rolled up our sleeping bags and camp pads and put our tent away. When we got to the shelter, my girlfriend screamed in horror. On the entrance to the shelter, the wood was freshly cut. The word KILL was cut into the shelter wall, and there were a number of axe and knife cuts where someone was chopping at the wall. I looked at the ground and saw a scattering of fresh wood splinters. After grabbing our food supply and garbage bag, we got out of there. We were nearly jogging with our gear as we made our way back to the car. I kept glancing back over my shoulder and gazing out through the woods to see if anyone was following us. We traversed the glacial eskers that we saw the day before, and we knew we were getting closer to our car. We were quietly rejoicing as we neared the trailhead. We made it back to the trailhead in near record time, but something was wrong. The windshield wiper on my car was sticking straight up and there was something stuck in the wiper. As we inched closer to the car, I saw there was blood smeared on the windshield and a squirrel carcass was impaled on the wiper blade. Hair and blood still stuck to the wiper and on the hood of the car. I didn't bother cleaning off the car. We threw our gear in the trunk and I sped off without removing the animal from the wiper blade. As I sped down the gravel logging road, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, but I could not see anything through the cloud of road dust behind the car. When we got to a gas station by the nearest town, I removed the carcass with a wad of newspaper, and I tried to remove as much dried blood as I could. I filled up on gas and we didn't stop until we made it to Milwaukee. This was the last trip I took to the woods of northern Wisconsin. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on the Great American Road Trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money, we would sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, we'd gotten so we could set up a camp in about 10 minutes. 
Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than 3 or 4 hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of people we met at a campsite, in the back of their pickup, because it got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go. We met an 80 year old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar, played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look out to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again, staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, we goofed around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met some pretty cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire there were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with a younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting up about our trip, families, everything. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite, and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of us for one of us to go get up to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Jokes of the foreigner and the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within 5 minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about how something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We would just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. Suddenly, there's a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen of the digital camera lit up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a photo of us without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in the headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he was doing was a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with the flash. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sits down, and a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some BS excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the heck out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV, and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking, I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off, because now he knows exactly where our car is. That is the only night we not set up camp. 
We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out the campsite. As we got into the dirt road, Ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. Ranger, let's not ever meet again. This happened on a Sunday night when I was about 10 years old in the mid-90s. My family house was on a short street, a dead end created by a railroad track. We had a three-story house, which was the farthest from the tracks, with windows on every floor, two in the basement. The stairs from our bedrooms upstairs led directly to the front door, which connected to a closed-in mudroom slash porch, which also had a screen door and a glass door that only locked from the inside. Even friends and extended family would wait outside to be let into the porch, as that's where the doorbell was. From inside the porch, you could see right up the stairs to the window and the door. Across the house, parallel to the front door was the back door. Both had a large window in them. It must have been June because my older brother had a soccer game, and I only had a week of school left. I personally found watching him struggle on the field and being forced to cheer while being eaten by bugs really boring, and I just got in a box set of books I desperately wanted to be alone with. After about an hour of reasoning and pleading, I finally convinced my parents to let me stay at home alone for the first time while they went to the game. They were only going to be gone for a few hours, and although we didn't live in the best neighborhood, our neighbors were close family friends. I'd be fine. Mistake. Usually before a game we'd all go out and eat together, but since I was staying home, they ordered a pizza from down the street, my brother's favorite. I'd already been face deep in the first book for half an hour when the doorbell rang. Pizza. I walked out from my bedroom and down the stairs to my living room. I got to the bottom of the stairs, and my father was at the door having a conversation with the delivery guy. They were talking about soccer, so I just decided to take the pizzas and keep on keeping on. Which is when I noticed the delivery guy staring at me, intently. He was a middle-aged Caucasian with an accent, and he was smiling at me in a way I recognized. It was the same smile I had on my face when I told my parents I was old enough to spend the evening in the house alone. Fake, but convincing. I walked past him through the living room to the kitchen and through the pizzas on the counter and shoved my face into my book. My father talked to him for a few more minutes about sports, and then closed the door. My family sat down to eat and chat while I forgot all about them, the food, and the delivery guy. Before they left, around 6.30pm, my parents wrote down all the emergency numbers, gave me instructions not to open the door, and headed out with my brother and I waved them off, excited to finally have the house to myself, if only to read in silence. I locked the main door and headed up to my room to read. It was blissfully quiet, save for the sound of my dog's occasional barking in the backyard. I had just finished the first book, and immediately started on the next when the doorbell rang, and my dog lost it in the backyard. I was up in my bed immediately. I looked at my alarm clock for the first time since they left, it read 8pm. My whole family was at the game, and any extended family in the province was as well. No one would be coming over without calling, especially on a Sunday night. The doorbell rang again, and again, again. I remained frozen in place, my book crumpling in my shaking hands. I, for the first time, was completely alone and terrified. My sly kid smile flashed in my mind, I thought I was so clever convincing my parents I wasn't scared to be alone, and then another smile flashed in my memory, the pizza guy. And then the banging started, loud successive bangs that rattled me if not the house. And now from the backyard my dog was livid. I could hear him barking and whining at the back door. I wanted to call someone, but the only phone was in the kitchen, which involved walking right past the front door. I panicked. I was scared to leave my room, as my feet would be visible to whomever it was once I entered the hallway. But what if it was just a neighbor? I checked the alarm clock again and was surprised that only minutes had gone by, and my parents wouldn't be back for an hour and a half, minimum. I'd have to wait it out, so I did. I got up as silently as possible and closed my bedroom door. Eventually, all the barking, ringing, and banging stopped. I waited for a half an hour, and then opened my door and crept out of my bedroom. I crept down the hallway to the top of the stairs, trying to press myself into the far wall, as out of sight as possible. But all the lights were on, and I realized that it was obvious that someone was home. I peered quickly down the stairs in the window, looking through to the glass porch door, and saw no one. Luckily, no one was there. I tore down the stairs and ran for the back door and checked outside. Nothing but my dog, who was all too happy to run inside. I let him in through a crack and slammed the door after him, locking it, and I realized it hadn't been locked before. I turned to the phone, grabbing it, and about to dial my neighbor's number, when my dog started acting like he was going to the vets. A low growl accompanied by a crouch, backing away. I froze and looked in his direction, then followed his gaze to the window in the inner front door, where inside my porch, past the front screen and glass doors, stood a man I'd never seen before, and he was staring at me, livid. I froze, paralyzed with fear as I looked at him, and I couldn't look away. He was tall, slim, and had bags under his eyes. His hair was shoulder length and unkempt. He lifted his hand and placed it on the window, and then looked down, as he tried to turn the knob, twice, but it was locked. I came out of my paralysis the second his eyes left mine, and I moved quickly to the side of the wall that led to the basement stairs. 
It blocked us from being able to see each other. Hiding. Hiding felt good. My dog, still in the corner, inched towards me, low to the ground and still growling. I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. This couldn't get any worse. Wrong. I saw you, boy. I saw you. Open the door. My stomach nestled in my throat. I started crying. I've never really had a flight or fight moment. Only flight or flight. But there was nowhere to go. Back upstairs led right past him, and going down into the basement seemed even more terrifying, as I'd have to walk past the window in the middle of the staircase that looked out into the alley leading to my backyard. I saw you. You can't hide forever. You have to pay. You have to pay. He screamed through the door window, shaking the door as he pulled on it. I thought he would just break the window and unlock the door, so I descended slowly down to the steps to the basement, going just halfway to put some distance between us. I stood still, waiting, and then silence. For a minute, nothing, and then the sound of the glass door and screen door to the outside opening and slamming. More silence. My dog straightened out, walked over to the top of the stairs, and then looked right past me, and started growling. I can still see you. I see you. I see you, boy, and you have to pay. I jumped and turned my head, and through the window to the alley, I saw his face. He was laying on the ground, staring at me. I see you. I know you're home. I see you. I bolted up the stairs to the inner front door, ripped it open, and then locked the glass door to the porch, and backed up into the living room, closing the main door behind me, locking that too. I ran to the kitchen, grabbed the phone, and unplugged it, and turned back around. He was at the door again, this time outside the porch. I steered myself, and ran up the stairs with the phone, dog in tow, to my parents' bedroom, which was the only room with a working phone jack and a lock on their door. And then the doorbell started to ring. I closed and locked their door behind me, left their light off, and plugged in the phone. I dialed my neighbors, and got their answering machine. I dialed again, no answer. Every ring of the phone was matched by a ring of the doorbell. I called them over and over, finally whispering a message. Tom, it's Kevin. I managed trying to get into the house and I'm alone. I peered out of my parents' window and looked down into the front yard. He was still there, pacing, walking up and down the stairs, looking in the windows, walking out of sight as he entered the alleyway, and then back into the front. I noticed my neighbor's car wasn't there. They weren't even home, and it still hadn't occurred to me to call 911, so I hunkered down and waited for my dog, watching from the corner of the window. He walked back up the porch, tried the door, and then the doorbell went off a few more times and then he walked down the stairs and headed back out into the street. He walked a bit down the sidewalk away from the dead end, towards the main road and then stopped, and turned around, walking back towards the house. He stopped again and looked up, directly at the window I was looking through, but the room was dark. He couldn't see me. Instead of turning back around, he continued walking down the street, and crossed the street when he reached the train tracks. He walked back up the other sidewalk, staring at my house all the while, and kept going until he reached the main intersection, and turned the corner. I stood in the corner of the window, watching the street for what seemed like hours, until my parents' car pulled up in front of the house, along with the neighbor's car. They all got out and my mother headed towards the house while my father started chatting with the neighbor's husband. I unlocked the door and booked it downstairs, instantly crying with relief as I unlocked the inner door, and then the glass porch door. I recounted the night's events to my parents in the kitchen through tears, and they had just started to calm me down. And that's when the doorbell rang. I started to shake and cry again, and my father burst out of his seat and barreled towards the door and swung it open. And there he was, the man. He stood there smiling a disgusting smile, and I immediately took off down into the basement. My mother was right behind me. I heard my father and him arguing loudly for a few minutes, and then my father slamming the door. My father called my mother and I back upstairs, and then after I made him promise the man was gone, I walked up into the kitchen. My father sat me down and explained the situation. Earlier, my father hadn't had enough cash on him for the pizzas. He had told the delivery guy that he would be back in 4 hours, but had to make the game and didn't have time to get more cash. The delivery guy agreed, wished my brother good luck in his game, and then had passed the message onto the guy who would be working the closing night shift. The delivery guy had misunderstood, thinking that he was to return immediately and collect payment. He explained it all to my father as if he had rang the doorbell a few times, and then had left. Not that he had been circling the house terrifying me for over an hour. He told my father he wasn't sure if anyone was home, so he looked around back, but only saw my dog. So he left, only returning, coincidentally, minutes after my parents returned, armed with a convincing story. Kids have such an imagination. Sorry that I frightened him. Suffice it to say, but I brought my books with me to every soccer game after that. This happened a couple weeks ago. I'm 17 and my parents were out of state for the month on vacation. I live in a small, nice neighborhood that has quite a distance from any other neighborhoods around us. My neighborhood likes to be involved with each other, so there's always neighborhood summer barbecues and neighborhood parties now and then. Everyone always attends to these, so I'm very familiar with who lives in the neighborhood as I can name off a majority of them. 
My neighborhood is always dead quiet after 9pm as the kids are inside by then and families are usually heading off to bed. I'm into spray paint art and I decided I wanted to work on a painting in my garage at around 10pm because it was cooler by then. Mind that the garage door is fully open. I'm setting out a tarp so I can start painting when I hear someone walking on the sidewalk. I look up expecting to say hi to a neighbor going on a late night walk around the neighborhood. Instead, it's a man I thought I couldn't recognize at first glance due to it being dark and the only descent light source around was from the garage. He was at least 6 foot 3, lanky, and looked completely normal from what I could see. The man stood at the end of my driveway facing me. With the little light stretching across the driveway hitting his face, I didn't recognize him. I live in a very friendly state where we're usually nice to strangers and make conversations. I thought nothing suspicious as he could have been just a neighbor I wasn't familiar with, so I just struck up a conversation like I usually do. Hi, how's it going? Uh, hi, it's going good so far. Sorry, I don't really recognize you because it's so dark. Oh, I'm Xavier. I don't think I've ever met you before. Did you just move into the neighborhood or something? Uh, yeah. I moved into the corner house up the street. You moved in with the Millers? Yeah, the Millers. I moved in with them. They're my cousins and they're letting me stay with them until I figure some things out. I thought nothing of this, as this seemed normal for a family to let a member of theirs stay with them for a while and the Millers are just those kind of people. Well, I better get going. I need to finish something. It was nice meeting you, Lainey. I never introduced myself, I think? Oh, the Millers told me all about you. I thought nothing of this as well because I would babysit the Miller's kids frequently and my family is close with them. Xavier kept walking and I thought nothing of what just happened and started painting. The next morning I went on a run to my high school that was about 3 miles away. My high school is on a common road that always has cars on it. As I was nearing the school, I heard a car pull up behind me. I stopped running and turned around to see a beat up car with the windows rolled down. A smiling man was sitting in the driver's seat. He looked to me in his mid to late 20s and he had a fairly handsome face. Hi. I probably had a confused look on my face as I didn't recognize the man, but I knew his voice from somewhere. Xavier, we met the other night. Oh, hi, sorry, I didn't recognize you. It's fine. Hey, you're pretty far from home. That's quite a long run. Aren't you tired? I can give you a ride home if you'd like. Oh no, it's fine. I like running. Thanks for the offer though. Wanna go out for a cup of coffee? No thanks, I don't drink coffee. We don't have to get coffee then. I'll pay for you. Come on, I wanna go get something with you. No thanks, I'm not really interested. Oh come on, let's go, hop in. He reaches over to open the passenger door and beckons me to come in. At this point, it's clear that I don't want to go and I step off from the grass and back onto the sidewalk. I said no, sorry. Come on, just get in the car. It's not a big deal. I gotta go. Some friends are expecting me. That's when I fall and sprint to the school's track and called a friend to pick me up. While waiting at the track for my friend to pick me up, Xavier's beat up car goes down the road, away from the direction of my neighborhood. A few bad things happened in my city, so I didn't think much of what happened and shook it off, which was stupid of me to do. A couple of days later there was a neighborhood barbecue. Although my parents weren't home, I didn't mind going to the barbecue alone because it's always a blast. I hung up with my neighborhood friends like I usually do. I saw the Millers and had a friendly conversation with them, which soon turned to, oh I met Xavier the other night. The Millers didn't know who I was talking about. They said they didn't know and Xavier, no family member moved in with them. I told them about what happened at the school the other day while I was on my run. The Millers and I are freaking out about now. They call over one of our neighbors who's a cop, we'll call him John. John lives a couple houses down from me. I tell him about the confrontations I had with the guy and what he looks like. He told me to call him or the cops if I didn't feel safe or if I encountered the guy again. John patrolled around our neighborhood for a few weeks. Neighbors kept a lookout for Xavier and didn't let their children out late. There was no son of Xavier for two weeks. I got back from a friend's house late at night. I pulled into the garage and went inside, turned on the lights, and I was making something to eat. Then there was a soft knock on the front door. It was late. I got back from a friend's and my guard was down so I walked across my house like I usually do. From the front door, you can hear footsteps if someone is walking to the door normally and not trying to hide their steps. I thought it was just a friend. I looked through the peephole and saw a wide smile that belonged to Xavier. He was at my door, late at night and he had a large backpack with him. He heard my footsteps and I could hear him say, I'm sorry about last time. I didn't mean to be like that Laney. It was just a bad day, through the door. I wanted him to go away. I meant to yell, get away from me, through the closed door but all that came out was a lame whimper. I just came to apologize, open the door, I don't mean any harm. He tries to wiggle the doorknob, his voice in constant pestering gets louder and louder. At this point I'm freaking out and I couldn't think at all. I couldn't remember where I put my phone. My family doesn't have a house phone either. Xavier began pounding on the door and repeatedly pushing on the doorbell and kept repeating, open the door Laney, open the door, they're waiting for us. My dog heard the ringing of the doorbell. I don't think he heard the soft knock because he was upstairs somewhere, but when my dog hears the doorbell, he's always excited to go look out the front window and see who's standing on the porch. If it's someone he recognizes, he'll just stand there quietly looking at them until one of us opens the door. When it's someone he doesn't recognize, he barks. He's a German Shepherd and his aggressive bark is very loud. 
My dog comes running down the stairs, looks at the window, and he doesn't recognize Xavier, so he starts barking at him from the window. Xavier laughs and I hear him say, They never told me you had a dog. You're smarter than they said you were, Laney. With my dog barking, I guess I snapped back into my senses. I realized I left my phone in my car in the garage. I called the cops and John. By the time they got here, Xavier was gone. I gave a description to them and they drove around the area for an hour looking for the guy, but they never found him. I stayed at a relative's house for a couple of days until my parents got back and we changed all the locks in the house and installed a security system along with floodlights. My parents had me on lockdown. John patrols around the neighborhood for a while after his shift ends every night now. Xavier, let's not meet again. I'm from the middle of nowhere, born and raised, which can get awfully boring. In order to shave off boredom in my particular little corner of nowhere, my friends and I often enjoy something called contra dancing, which is basically New England folk dancing, where one pairs off with a different, random partner at each dance. This hobby would bring us to all corners of the area and in contact with lots of interesting and usually older people. One night, a friend and I had driven about 40 minutes into the woods to this old townhouse. It's an incredibly scenic little area, even at night, great view of the stars, crickets chirping, people dancing in the tiny town hall. A perfect hot summer night with friends and about 60 others, again mostly old town folk. I had even made cookies for everyone to enjoy, which was announced at the beginning of the dance and was applauded by everyone there. I had danced maybe two dances when an older man in his mid-sixties approached me for a dance. This was far from unusual, in fact, most of my dance partners were over 40. I had seen this guy at several contra dances, so he definitely wasn't new. This guy came off kinda creepy though. Most of the older guys struck 18 year old me as grandfatherly, but some just are uncomfortable to be close to. I refused him, saying I promised my friend a dance. He insisted that I dance the dance after with him. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed, trying to be as perky as possible so he didn't know he was making me uncomfortable. You look so beautiful tonight, was the first thing out of his mouth when we paired up for the dance. I kind of just smiled and nodded, I didn't want to be encouraging. He was sweaty, had a walrus mustache, and was bald except for crown of grey hair. The dance was a particular extravagant one, with a move called a gypsy, when the partners staring into each other's eyes while circling around each other into a swing. He started making remarks under his breath during this move, such as, get over here and can't get away from me, while pulling me closer. Gross, but nothing too bad. I heard you made the cookies. They were delicious. I'll have to get the recipe out of you, or just make you my wife. Then I have them all to myself. I almost stopped the dance to get away from him, but I shut down and refused eye contact and conversation. I was sufficiently grossed out, but it was nothing too bad. I pulled my friend aside after and told her about him, and then enjoyed the rest of my night. After summer dances, the young people often drive down to a small pond and swim to get off the sweat and grossness of the dance. Skinny dipping is encouraged, as this spot is really in the middle of nowhere, no houses around, and an absolute amazing view of the stars. My friend and I spent about 20 minutes hanging out in the water, with people slowly leaving, until we were the only ones left. That's what I thought at least. Until I saw a figure standing at the bank of the pond staring out at us. I didn't call out, assuming it was one of our friends. I swam closer, starting to get out of the water. It wasn't until I was actually fully out of the water, clothed only in a t-shirt and underwear, that I recognized the old man from before. I lurched a fear and wrongness I felt in that moment I will never forget. I have never seen anyone above the age of 25 go down to the pond with us, and he was fully clothed and not there for a swim. He also wasn't saying anything. Shannon, we have to go now. I yelled back at her. The pond bank was narrow and it was hard to scramble around him. I was pretending I couldn't see him, that he wasn't there, or that I didn't care he was there. Shannon was about 20 feet behind me when he turned to follow me back to the cars. The rocks were painful to walk on and made it hard to move quickly. I heard you guys were coming down here, he said. At this point, Shannon was just coming near him. She did not recognize him from earlier stories, it wasn't reacting to the creepiness as strongly as I was. Haha, <laughs> yeah, sometimes we cool off down here, Shannon replied. He got between me and her, blocking her from the car. You know, you and your friend look like sisters. I heard she made the cookies. Do you cook as well as her? I'd love a pair of you at home. This is when the situation really hits Shannon. We're alone, with this guy who's apparently followed us to the middle of nowhere, with unknown intentions. It was nice talking to you, but we have to go now. Come on, Shannon. I was practically running to the car, throwing the words over my shoulders. He put a hand on Shannon's bare shoulder, which spurred her after me. Come on, you two. I'm just trying to have some fun. I was already in reverse by the time Shannon got in the car with me. We tore out of the dirt road at about 50 miles per hour and hit pavement at around 70. I almost puked when I saw headlights turn out from the road, following us. Since I was about 40 minutes from home through all the back roads, I took a gamble and headed towards the nearest gas station, followed the whole way. We stopped at the station, right in front of those huge windows in front. He slowed down, looked at us, and then sped away. I haven't seen him at a contra dance since, which is the scariest thing to me, as he used to be a regular. 
In my experience, Contra dancers are a loyal bunch, but this guy just sort of drifted in for a couple months and disappeared just as quickly. Still makes me uncomfortable to think about. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I live in the foothills of the Appalachia Mountains in Northeast Georgia. It's a beautiful area with hundreds of miles of national forest, some great state parks, and a ton of fantastic camping places. Unfortunately, my hometown is also relatively poor. While there are some out-of-town residents from Atlanta and other places, a lot of people where I live are really poor. I do freelance work as a technical writer, so I can do most of my work online. If I didn't have that going for me, I'd have to move somewhere else. It's just one of those small towns that will rob you of your ability to accomplish anything in life if you stay there for too long, without anything else going for you at least. Excluding a handful of doctors and lawyers and Georgia Power Company employees, the only employment in the area is at Walmart, fast food, and a couple of grocery stores. To the east of my town, there's a massive national forest. It's loaded with great camping sites and lots of relatively unused hiking trails. I really enjoy hiking on them with my dog, but it can be a bit of an unnerving experience sometimes. It's about a 10 mile drive from town, and there's no cell phone services or homes for miles. In the past, there have been a lot of vehicle break-ins at the trailheads. The gravel parking lots at some of them glitter with bits of broken glass from what I'm guessing were car windows. Sometimes, there are really shifty people hanging around these trailheads or just driving around on the forest service roads. These are really rough roads, and you'll just see these beat up $500 cars just barreling along roads meant for a truck. All that being said, it's still a great place to camp, however, you just have to be careful. A few years ago, two of my friends and I decided to go play paintball in the national forest. Probably not legal, I know. We decided to turn the paintball expedition into a camping trip so we could play the next morning too. After a pretty uneventful day of shooting paintballs at each other, we drive a couple miles to one of the more popular camping spots. Unfortunately, a church group or something had taken up all the spots in the area. This was really the only camping spot that we were familiar with, and it was getting pretty late. We decide to keep on looking, so we drive for about an hour further and further into the woods. By this time, it's getting a bit dark and we're getting a bit worried about finding a spot. We all had GPS on our smartphones, but none of us had any service. We turn off onto an unfamiliar road that isn't in very good shape. In fact, it looks like the forest service rangers used a backhoe to block off the road with a mound of dirt. A broken metal barrier lay in the woods nearby. That said, it looked like trucks had been going over the mound, so it was pretty worn down. Our F-150 had pretty high clearance, so we decided to go over the mound. There was an old gravel road on the other side, and the road was pretty much clear of debris. We drove a few miles down this road, and came across an opening next to a small creek. There were some blue tarps hanging over a plywood table nailed to a tree, which seemed kind of odd. That said, it was pretty much dark at this point, and we didn't want to keep driving around all night looking for a camping spot. We left the truck light running, and we set up the tent. As we were setting up the tent, I started to notice that there was a lot of trash in the woods surrounding the site. I see a green bottle laying on the ground. I take a look at the label, and see that it's a bottle of home and garden insecticide. I was really tired at the time, and I just thought that someone had been dumping their home garbage out here. None of us thought that it was weird that someone would be dumping garbage in an area that is more than an hour from the nearest home. We set up camp, had some beers, and made chili from scratch. By this time, it was probably around 11pm. As we're eating, we notice a faint glow from the other side of a nearby hill. At first, we thought it was moonlight filtering its way through the trees. However, the angles didn't make sense. It didn't seem to be a bright light, and it wasn't moving. It was kind of like that glow you see over a bright city. We couldn't see the light source itself though. Since there were no other access roads in the area, we decided it wasn't other campers. The hill was about a quarter mile from our campsite, so we decided to go investigate. Under normal circumstances, I know I wouldn't have done so. However, we all had a few rum and cokes in our stomachs, and two of us, Jacob and I, decided to take a look. My other friend Isaac decides to stay behind to pop some popcorn over the fire. We start walking towards the light source, and the situation gets even stranger. All the trees in the area have their bark knocked off in a circle around their trunks. We thought it could have been the work of a beaver that lived in the creek, but it seems strange that a beaver would go around all these trees and just knock the bark off in a circle. Jacob and I start talking about the ghost beaver in pretty loud voices, probably due to our drunkness. As we're almost to the top of the hill, Jacob tripped and yelled, oh crap. A few seconds after he yelled, the light, whatever it was, went out. We look at each other and decide that maybe we don't need to see what the light was after all. We walk back in silence and keep looking back every few seconds. We decide to turn off our flashlight and just use the moonlight to get back to our campsite. When we get a couple of hundred feet from the campsite, I can see my other friend Isaac walking around the campsite. He was wearing a hooded coat that I hadn't seen him wearing before. For some reason, he's carrying his paintball gun around in his hand. This seemed a little odd, we said to each other. The fire had started to die down, so we couldn't see our campsite very well. At this point, 
We'd probably been gone for almost an hour. From the distance, it looked like Isaac was looking for something. He kept walking around the site and was peering at the tent. When we were almost back to the campsite, we saw Isaac walk up the road we came in on. We figured that he was going to use the bathroom and didn't want to wander through the woods like us. When we got back, we sat next to the fire and waited for Isaac to come back. All of a sudden, we see him lurch out the tent. He stumbles a few feet and vomits. After we left, he had a few more rum and cokes, he mumbles. We ask him why he kept wandering around the campsite with a paintball gun, and he gets a strange look on his face. They're locked up in the cab of the trunk. Did you unlock it? We go and check the trunk, enter the door code, and see all of our paintball equipment just as we left it before. The keys to the trunk were still hidden in a magnetic fob underneath. I get a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Isaac, what were you doing after we left? I ask. Uh, I was watching a movie on my phone, then I fell asleep I guess. But, you were walking around with your paintball gun, right? Did you just change jackets? Isaac said that he had been in the tent since we left, and that he had been wearing the same unhooded fleece all night. Someone had been walking around our campsite, and it wasn't Isaac. At this point, all of us were way too drunk to drive, but we decided to go ahead and pack up and go back to my house for the night. We don't bother packing up the tent, which is folded down with the sleeping bags and everything in it. We jump in the F-150 and I start to drive out. When we get to the dirt hump, we see something gray blocking our path. The metal barrier had been lying in the woods earlier is now back on its stand, right on top of the hump earlier. By this point, all of us have sobered up to the situation. No one wants to get out of the car to try to move the barrier. I had a metal guard on the front of the F-150, so I drive forward slowly, tapping the metal barrier with the front of my truck. It falls right off, it must have just been balanced on the top, and we drive over it slowly. We were terrified that it would pop one of the truck's tires as we drove over it, but it didn't. As we drive down the road, we see a vehicle following us with its lights off. It's probably 1,000 feet behind us, but we keep catching glimpses of it as the moon reflects light off of it. I start to drive as fast as I can on the forest service road, and the other vehicle keeps pace. It doesn't get any closer though. It stays just one or two turns behind us. We can only see it when the road straightens out. After about 45 minutes of speeding along gravel roads, we make it back to the main paved road. I start to drive everyone back to my house, but I decide to go to a different way just to be safe. I didn't get pulled over for a DOI luckily. Camping can be fun, but very rural camping can be very dangerous. I've driven past that metal barrier since that time, but it's always been in place. I would never go down that road again. When I was 15 years old, I lived in a rural area about 20 minutes outside of the actual town I called home. I was home from school alone one day, and a white car pulled up in front of our mailbox and stopped. I was upstairs in my room and saw from the window, but could not see who was in the car. Whoever it was sat there for several minutes without getting out of the vehicle, long enough to weird me out, and then drove away. We weren't super close in distance to our neighbors, but we weren't miles and miles apart, and I remembered that one neighbor a bit down was selling their house. I chalked it up to a potential buyer having the wrong address, or simply checking out the neighborhood, and thought nothing else of it. Fast forward about a week or so, it was a Friday night and I had gone downtown to see the premiere of a movie with my boyfriend at the time. I remember it was a special occasion and I had begged my parents consistently for weeks to push back my curfew so I could see this movie, since it wouldn't be over until after 1am, and it took 20 minutes to get home from town, they were reluctant but finally agreed. When the movie was over, my boyfriend Jason and I walked slowly to the truck, it was a well-lit and relatively safe area, so we stood around in the parking deck trying to push curfew for as long as possible. There weren't many vehicles at the time of night, but I realized suddenly that I recognized the one parked straight across from us, the same white car that had been at my house a week earlier. The car was running, and there was a man, probably mid-30s, sitting alone inside. I could have passed this all off as a coincidence, except as I continued to look at him, he turned his bright lights on us and spun out of the parking deck after almost running into Jason's truck. I obviously had a horrible feeling about this and asked Jason to take me home immediately. As we pulled out of the garage, we saw the car parked across the street from the movie theater. All the lights off, man still inside, but he didn't follow us so we just went home a little shaken. I had no idea at the moment, but this was the start of three long, torturous years of being stalked by this man. A couple of months after the parking deck situation, the encounters became more frequent and weirder and I hated being anywhere alone at any time. I never knew when and where I could see him or how much time would pass between encounters. It became clear that he was watching me all the time by this point because he only made himself known when I was alone or with my boyfriend, never my parents or even other friends. I became terrified for some stupid reason that none of my friends would believe me if I told them I kept it between Jason and my family. Until one day, my friend Rachel who lived maybe 5 miles away from me started telling me about this creepy man who showed up at her house over the weekend. Rachel's dad worked Saturdays, so she was home alone with another friend of ours, Megan. Everything was normal until around dusk when they began to smell cigarette smoke. My heart instantly began racing because, by this time, this was becoming an everyday occurrence for me. 
I was smelling cigarette smoke, finding cigarette butts around my house even though none of my family smoked, and could never trace the source. I had a nagging feeling of course that it was connected to my stalker, but hadn't confirmed. So as Rachel and Megan were looking for the source of the smoke, Rachel realized she had left a window in a back room open and the smoke was coming in from the back porch. Seeing that there was a strange man on our porch, she quickly goes to close and lock the window and, in her words, he turns around with dead eyes and looks straight through her like she wasn't really there. Megan immediately called the police, but Rachel continued to stand there in a little bit of shock as he smirked at her and stared until his cigarette was gone. He then got up and calmly walked away. The police came but found no trace of him except for cigarette butts on the porch and scattered around the backyard, indicating he had been there for quite some time. I immediately began to describe the creep to Rachel and it was the same man. She hadn't seen or heard the white car at all, and they guessed that he had parked down the road and walked down Rachel's almost mile long driveway or through the woods a bit. As time went on, my stories were well documented with the police department, but they had never even seen the guy he was so good at getting away. I have to give them credit because they never doubted the truth of my stories and always showed up quickly even as it was becoming apparent that the guy knew what he was doing It wasn't planning to be caught anytime soon. We also began to suspect he had a police scanner in his car. One night in particular, almost two years after the Rachel incident, Jason and I were coming home a little early from a date. My parents had gone out as well that night and we had a strict rule that we couldn't be home alone with no adults. So Jason and I began to talk in the driveway since my dad had called and they were only about 10 minutes away. We were too scared, given the circumstances to get out of the truck and we kept our eyes peeled for the creep, but we figured 10 minutes wasn't all that long. Sure as the world, not even a minute later we saw headlights turn on in the bushes across the street from my driveway. This freak had backed his car into the bushes and waited for us to come home. Jason immediately got on the phone with the cops and I called my dad who was literally flying home at this point, as the man revved up his engine and flashed his lights. He then proceeded to get out of his car and walk toward Jason's truck. I will never forget he was so slow, methodical, and emotionless. It felt like I was living out of a serial killer movie. I was sobbing. We had the doors locked of course as the man walked up to the passenger side where I was sitting and stood only a couple feet away from my window staring at me. He never made a move for the door. He simply stood completely still and stared. He held eye contact with me and his eyes were like black holes. Jason was a baseball player and had been keeping a bat in the backseat exactly for a moment like this. He pulled me toward him and away from the window and grabbed the bat but this man didn't even flinch. He switched his gaze to the bat for a few seconds, smiled this huge and disgusting grin, walked back to his car and drove away. It seemed like 40 minutes passed, but it couldn't have been more than 5 because the man was gone for a couple minutes before my dad came into our driveway doing like 80 miles per hour. The cops never caught up to him. There were many more stories of torture such as leaving dead animals outside of our front porch and shining flashlights into our windows in the middle of the night, but nothing anyone did could trip this guy up. My family had tried everything. My older brother had even desperately tried to chase the guy through the woods behind our house one night and lost him. The police wanted to help, but they only had my stories and the cooperation of my boyfriend, Rachel's encounter, and one kind of vague sighting of the car in town. I didn't even have a name for anyone to file a restraining order against. Not that it would have done me any good. And maybe the creepiest part of all this, in three whole years, he never spoke a single word. Then one day, just as quickly as he showed up, every single trace of him completely disappeared. Just like that. I never knew if he died, was arrested for some other crime, or just lost interest, even though that seemed highly unlikely. I just simply never saw him again, and it has now been 10 years. I still occasionally feel the lasting effects of that time, but thankfully, life has become pretty normal again. Needless to say, disturbed stalker who made me miserable for years, let's not meet again. This took place when I was 19, now 28. I was in college and working as a bartender at a little country bar further out from the city. This place was also supposed to be a 21 plus only because there were gambling machines right along the bar, but the rule was, if anyone asked, you just turn 21. For the most part, I loved the job and loved the money. After a few weeks, I came in at 8pm to start my shift, and it was already a pretty good crowd to be a weeknight. I make my rounds to see an attractive guy and his beer is empty, so I ask if he needs another. He immediately sparks up a conversation with me. I found out he's 28, a paralegal, has a dog, etc. He finishes his new beer and leaves me a $20 bill as a tip, with a rose he made out of a bar napkin. This continued nightly for about a week, and we eventually exchanged phone numbers. I ended up letting him know that I wasn't 21, just in case things progressed and he said he didn't mind, blah blah blah. He would come into the bar nightly, text me after he left, and the following days, until he came back into the bar that night. About two weeks go by, and I take a long weekend to go out of town, around three hours away. It was St. Patrick's Day weekend that year, so my friends and I went to a party of course. The guy, we'll call him Patrick, that's convenient, was continuing to text me, but I never let him know I was going anywhere. Things weren't serious to me. I never hung out with him, I sat on my work shifts, 
so what's there to tell? I then get a phone call from one of the girls at work telling me there's a guy there that will not stop asking me where I am and when I'm coming to work. Turns out, it's Patrick. Immediate red flag to me, but I didn't want them to deal with the drama, so I text him and let him know I'll be back on Sunday, leaving out that I would be back and going straight to work that evening because honestly, I didn't want him to know that I'd be at the bar. He continues to text me all weekend and I respond to keep the peace. I show up to work that Sunday to a new bounce that the owner hired. I can't tell you why, but I had this feeling, so I go ahead and spill about Patrick onto him just in case he showed up. A few hours pass and two guys come in and sit down. I stare at them for a minute and realize they're two guys that Patrick's been in there with before. I ask if they want anything and they just ask for water. Sure enough, after I notice one of them make a phone call, here comes Patrick in the door. I immediately shoot the bouncer a look and he catches my drift. Patrick sits down and I keep the combo short and get his beer. He just keeps watching every single move I make. They eventually get up and go to the pool table and the jukebox. Next thing I know, brown eyed girl is playing. I have brown eyes of course. And Patrick is standing there smiling at me. The song is over and I tell the bouncer to watch the bar for me. I needed to step out back and smoke a cigarette before I had a panic attack. I left the back door open so I could watch the bar for any new customers. Next thing I know, The Kill by 30 Seconds to Mars is playing. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. The bouncer comes to the door and is asking me for details about the guy in the situation. Here comes Patrick storming towards us. So he's why you aren't interested anymore? Literally starts a scene, going on about how he is heartbroken and I can't believe I could do this to him. I'm just standing there smoking another cigarette, watching the crazy unfold on this guy. The bouncer finally gets him out and after a few minutes I felt like I could breathe and go on about my night. It's 3am so we start to clean up and the bouncer goes to take the trash out. He comes in and locks the door and tells me Patrick is in his car in our parking lot but not to worry because he'll walk me to my car and not go straight home in case Patrick tries to unleash more crazy on me. So I leave and sure enough in my rear view is the face of a stalker. I decide to go to Sheets and get some breakfast slash dinner. That's a well lit, busy place at any time of the day, right? I go in and order my food and here comes Patrick. I keep my back to him hoping he'll take a hint but this guy comes right up to me and puts his arm around my shoulders. I step to the side and he just casually laughs and then grabs my hand. I honestly can't even remember what I said, but something along the lines that he's a psycho and he leaves. I pay for my food, no sign of him in the parking lot, and head to my apartment. I remember being extremely anxious because you had to park across the street, but I made sure to have my key ready and everything in my hands to make a run for it. I get inside, lock the door, eat my food, shower, and finally lay down. Then I hear it, the doorknob slightly jiggling. I was frozen in fear. I hear it again, this time louder. I went to get up to look out the peephole, but the floor was so old and squeaky, I took one step and was frozen again. This went on for minutes, and then it finally just stopped. It was going to be daylight soon, so I just laid there until I was safe. I get a text from Patrick the next day, apologizing for the night before, asking to get lunch, and says he wants me to meet his mother. I tell him to stop contacting me. I found him on Facebook and went ahead and blocked him so he couldn't use that as a way to communicate. The text continued daily for months with no response from me, and I remember one day I didn't get a text and thought, oh it's finally over. I received one text a year until I got a new number around 5 years ago and it would always say, thinking of you. Luckily I moved away and never ran into him again. I just can't help but think what would have happened if I wouldn't have gotten serious or went on a date with that guy. I had a stalker in junior high and high school. This was back in the early 2000s, without being too specific. As far as I know, this guy is still out there somewhere. We met each other through an extracurricular activity group, and he struck me as a shy and quiet guy. I was rather shy myself. For the time being, we had only seen each other at these extracurricular get-togethers maybe once or twice a month. I don't remember when it happened or how, but we exchanged phone numbers and he asked me to go to a dance with him at his high school since he was maybe two years older than me. Surprisingly, my mom agreed and I was genuinely excited. The day rolled around and we arrived at the town where the boy lived. The dance happened and we danced together pretty much exclusively from what I remember, and maybe only once did we dance very close together. Maybe a couple months down the road I had the opportunity to invite him to see a movie with my sisters and I, which we accepted and my parents agreed would be fine. All that happened at that time was we exchanged a few pleasantries before and after, but beside that we only watched the movie, and I wouldn't really have considered that to be a date. After some time the boys started calling me almost every week, which was fun and nice at first, but he was exceedingly awkward despite how long we'd been communicating, and continued to be just as awkward to talk to no matter how many times he spoke. His voice was always very low and soft, and he spoke almost exclusively in short sentences, letting me do most of the talking. Honestly, there wasn't much going on in my life, so we ran out of things to talk about pretty quickly, but he often kept me on the phone for about an hour each time. 
It came to be that after a time I would get sick of talking to him. He didn't really contribute to the conversations, and I didn't have an interesting enough life to carry it on by myself. In addition to the phone calls, the guy also had my home address and email too. He would send mostly funny chain letter type emails, and occasionally would write me a letter. The frequency of those was never enough to bother me, but the phone calls were really wearing me down. Later on we moved to a different state during the summer, and the guy weaseled my new phone number and address out of me. I was kind of hoping that he'd have lost interest at this point, but that was not the case. One afternoon, out of the blue, our doorbell rang and I answered it. Being the closest one to the door, to my surprise, the guy was there at the door along with a super tall male friend of his whom I didn't know or recognize. I greeted the guys with a smile and asked them what they were doing there. I didn't think it was weird at first, but the longer this interaction went on, the stranger it became. For one thing, neither one said a word, and they both came towards me like they were going to push past me to the house, but once they noticed my parents were there, they kind of stopped and looked at each other as if they didn't know what to do now. Me, not getting the gravity of the situation, invited them in and showed them the comic book I had been working on since the beginning of that summer. If the guy spoke at all, it was only very briefly, and his friend said nothing, nor was he introduced to me. Despite having driven supposedly from his hometown, which would have been more than 100 miles away mind you, they only stayed for maybe 5 minutes and then they both left. Only later did I fit the pieces together and realize that the picture it made was very dark and sinister. I decided after we moved to a different house that I wouldn't give him my forwarding address any longer, but he still had our home phone number, since that hadn't really changed. Maybe a year or two after the surprise visit, I was home from school at our new house when the phone rang. I answered it, thinking it could be one of my friends from school, but it was the guy. I sighed, being unwilling to just tell him I didn't want to talk, and sat on the stairs with my chin in my hand, wishing my mom would come home so she could get me off the phone. After a while, the guy asked me what was wrong because I wasn't talking that much, and I kept yawning or sighing, so I said, I'm just tired. Well, you don't look tired. My eyes started to all windows I could see from where I sat on the stairs. Could he see me? Where was he right now? How did he find our new house when I hadn't told him the address and we weren't listed in the phone book? I suddenly blurted out, I have to go, hung up the phone, ran up the stairs, locked myself in the bathroom and called my mom. I was terrified that the next thing I would hear was glass breaking and him coming to find me in the house. Mom told me not to move and she would be home in a few minutes. I should have called the cops honestly. The next time he called, only a few days later, and he acted like he hadn't been a creep at all just one phone call ago, I told him flat out that if he ever called me again I would call the police. I am still afraid of this guy. I don't know how he found me and I'm a little afraid he could find me again. Hopefully, I don't have to meet him again. When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were out partying and drinking, I was home alone. In 1996, my parents had split up, and from there they divorced, and my mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone, and my mother was currently out of state. Now, this didn't worry me, as this was not the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter saying they had gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road surrounded by trees and set a few miles out of town, and I knew most of the people, if not by name, then by face enough to wave and small chat with, and had never been before given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my little bubble of home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird sounds outside, but I remember thinking it was probably the neighbors. Though they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party slash people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, just sort of in a panic daze, because it was near midnight and pitch black. I remember thinking the power must have gone out and that it would come back on, so I just decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and wait. A few minutes passed by when I heard a noise in the kitchen, where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest, because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room, where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard that sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Every noise suddenly felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours, crawled onto the ottoman, and started as slowly and as quietly as I could make my way toward the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark in the ottoman, from playing hide-to-go-seek in the dark many many times with my friends during sleepovers. 
I was nearly there when the footsteps became more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now and toward the living room. They weren't hurried or anything. It was like they were just moving around in the kitchen. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor, and to my horror there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream, however, I did panic. I stood immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway, and I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I bypassed the front door, the guest room, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway, my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have been able to get the front door unlocked and open in time, as it was right off the side of the couch. When I was 10, I got a bird for my birthday. He was a blue fronted Amazon, and I named him Boo, because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It could have been metal, but very large, sturdy, and like 6 feet tall, and it was kept in my room. Despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had the run of the house whenever he wanted. This information will become relevant later in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn locks that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked, if they did it to mock me or to scare me, but I knew in my heart that my little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It didn't keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to brute force. I was panicking, on the verge of tears when the person started laughing. It was low, quiet, and because of that it was even more frightening. It wasn't like manic laughter, but as if they were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me, and I started heavily, hysterically crying and looking around my room to figure out what I could do. That is when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in. Because suddenly, they threw themselves at my door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred by the movement awake, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have screamed with him, but honestly, I don't remember screaming. I just remember being extremely scared. Terrified, I crawled under my bed slash couch, a bunk bed with a futon on the bottom, metal, and waited. Several minutes passed and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued screaming even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed gave me no feelings of being secure, I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to go out the window, but I was afraid he might expect it and therefore be waiting for me on the other side. And it was also several feet off the ground, as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed, terrified for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep because I awoke the next morning to daylight. The fear of what happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever had been in my house might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's since it was daylight outside, and therefore I felt less afraid. I crawled out of the window and once I was back on my feet however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed the back door was wide open. Scared, but feeling braver now that I was outside and that it was morning instead of pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go inside. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding room-to-room check, looking in closets and under beds, behind the couch, anywhere I thought even a small child might be able to fit. I even popped the lock on my mom's bedroom so I could check it, and then relocked it afterwards. When I was positive that there was no one there, I went back to lock the back door. I had left it open in case I needed to escape, and noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door, and then called my mom, where I once again broke down crying hysterically. She called a co-worker, who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but I always went with her from then on forward. So terrifying laughing crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve, please, let's not ever meet again. One summer evening, I hung out with my girlfriend for the day at her house. I ended up leaving around 10 or 11 p.m., so it was quite dark out. Before I drove off though, my girlfriend hung out with me in my car for a few minutes. Now my car was an early 90s Pontiac sedan, it did not have automatic locks. When my girlfriend stepped out of the car, she did not lock the door again. I drove off and instead of having taken the back road home like I usually did, I decided to take the main road. Since it was late, there wasn't many cars out. However, there was a lady standing next to a bus stop. She was pacing around in a circle. I got the sense that she was anxious or nervous about something. When she saw my car, she flagged me down. I pulled over and reached over to roll down the window. No automatic windows either. That's when I noticed the door wasn't locked, and before I could do anything, the lady opened the passenger door and took a seat. I was surprised by this, but didn't feel like this lady was a threat. She was white, blonde hair, and probably in her late 30s or early 40s. I asked her if she's okay or if she needs help. 
She tells me that she's trying to get home, but her phone died so she couldn't get a hold of anyone. She also said that she missed the late bus. This sounded plausible to me, and since she didn't seem threatening and she was already in my car, I offer to drive her home. I start driving up the main road and ask her for directions to her place. We drove for maybe two minutes when she told me to turn into a residential neighborhood. As we're driving through here, she started talking to me nonstop. Thank you so much for stopping. Not everyone is nice as you. Your car is super awesome too. I replied with a weak, yeah thanks. She went on. It's so nice to find someone who is so trusting this late at night. I like trusting people. At that point, we came to a stop sign so I looked left and then right. When I turned to the right, she gave me a creepy smile, like ear to ear joker type smile. I also noticed for the first time that her pupils were very dilated and darting around all over the place. At this point, I finally started to realize that picking up a strange woman late at night who may be on drugs perhaps was not the best idea. I started to think of ways to get her out of the car, but I also didn't want to be rude. Before I could think of anything though, she asked me for my phone so she could give her friend a call and let them know that she was coming home. I sheepishly lied to her and said I didn't own a phone. I was then struck with a feeling of dread because my phone's ringer was set too loud and any notification or message would reveal my lie. Just my luck a moment later someone texted me and my phone went off. I thought you didn't have a phone. Oh I forgot that I had it, I thought I left it at home. I don't appreciate being lied to. She trailed off as she had more to say. I started to get really nervous at this point. We were deep in this neighborhood but it was really dark. I needed to get this lady out now. She then points up the road and tells me to take a right at the next stop sign. The road curved a bit so from where I was I could see that there was a dead end sign. For whatever reason the thought of turning onto this dead end street terrified me. I then had an idea. Right before we got to the stop sign, I pulled over and told the lady that my car was making a funny noise and the temperature gauge was slowly going up. I turned off my car and popped my trunk. I told her I was grabbing a flashlight from the trunk and if she could step out and hold the light for me while I looked at the engine. I got out of the car. I looked back at her and she looked both mad and annoyed but she also stepped out. I went to my trunk and rummaged through the things I had there for a few seconds. My flashlight was right in front of me but I needed to be sure that she was standing in front of the car. Once she was there I closed my trunk and started walking to the front of the car with my flashlight. My heart was pounding but I knew I had to keep my voice steady. I gave her the flashlight and then said something like, oops, I forgot to pop open the hood, let me do that real quick. I got back in my car and I did pop my hood. At the same time though, I turned the car back on and threw it in reverse. The lady just stood there, staring at me. Once I had enough distance, I put the car back in drive and drove straight past her. She was standing near a street light so I got one last good look at her. I noticed she was holding a knife or some sorts in her hands. There was also a large man that stepped out of the shadows and stood next to her. At first I thought she might be getting attacked, but then they walked away together. I know that this was 100% my fault. It was stupid of me to let her get in my car and even stupider for me to agree to drive her home. I don't know why she didn't even try to attack me earlier. I don't know if they were looking to simply carjack me or do something else. Despite fully accepting the blame, middle aged blonde lady, let's not meet again. This story happened about 2 years ago while I was in university working on my degree in biology. I had signed up for a trip to gather samples for an experiment some students in the ecology department were going to run. It required the collection of samples from several sites so they recruited biology, ecology, and forestry majors to help them complete the sampling in a shorter period. The area my group was to take samples from was a few hours from my uni in the Pacific Northwest. There are 9 of us in my group, 8 students and a supervising professor. We got to the campsite in the late evening and set up our tents. One of the other students had brought a big container of split pea soup from home and was sharing it with the others on the trip. I don't really care for split pea soup so I declined the offer. Everyone had some except me, one other student, and the professor. Come the next morning the five students who had eaten the soup weren't in the best of shape. They were in the grips of some gnarly food poisoning and were in no shape to hike for 8 or 9 hours to collect the samples we needed. The professor who was supervising us had originally set some rules such as people travel in groups of at least two and we had to return to camp by nightfall. Now those rules were tossed out to make sure we kept to our timetable and collected all the required samples. We were just told to do your best to complete the work assigned as long as you can do it safely. That morning I set up for a long day of hiking. After a mile or so, I ran into the stream I was supposed to follow. I needed to travel about 4 miles upstream stopping every quarter mile to collect samples of the water and soil. This meant I had to hustle to get back before dark. Halfway through the day I realized that wasn't going to happen. About 2 miles into my hike, I stopped for lunch sitting on a log overlooking the stream. The scene was really peaceful until I smelled the cigarettes. It wasn't the smell of a cigarette being smoked, more the musty smell of a heavy smoker's car where cigarette butts had been left to ferment for weeks on end. 
I looked around but couldn't see anyone. I just assumed that the wind had blown the scent of some hunter or hiker over to me, but minutes later the smell hadn't faded. The vegetation in the area wasn't that thick, but there was still a lot of places for someone to duck behind a tree or bush. I was unnerved that someone was apparently staying close enough to me for me to smell them for this long without so much as a word. I quickly packed up the trash for my lunch and continued up the stream. The musty cigarette smell went away for the next few hours. It wasn't until I arrived at my last sample location late into dust that I smelled it again. The woods were getting really dim by this point. Looking back on it, it was a really stupid idea to stay out so late as just hiking back to camp in the dark would be pretty dangerous even without a cigarette smoking stalker. Having just put the collection tubes in my bag, I shined my flashlight around the darkening woods looking for whoever was giving off the smell. I didn't see anything that caught my attention. It would actually be more correct to say I saw too many things in the dim light that might have been a head sticking out from behind a tree or someone crouched low in the foliage. I didn't like the idea of being in the dark woods with a stranger who for the second time was lurking near me without revealing themselves, so I began to double time it back down the stream. I made much better time on my way back even though it was dark because I didn't have to stop to take any samples. Even so I didn't get back to camp till a bit before 10. I was the last one to get back and everyone but the professor was already asleep. I didn't mention the cigarette smell to the professor because he seemed tired as it was and he headed to his bed in the RV soon after I got back. I headed to my tent soon after. At some point in the night I woke up needing to pee. I decided to head into the woods to do my business as I knew some of the other students were still feeling ill and needed the RV toilet for more urgent matters than just having to take a leak. I walked about 100 feet into the woods, found a tree and did what I needed to do. As I turned to go back to camp something caught my eye. Somewhere off in the woods was a tiny, red glow. I was confused as to what it was until it flared momentarily and I realized it was the cherry of a cigarette. I stood there for a while watching the red ember glow, fade, then move slightly closer to the ground as whoever was smoking would take it out of their mouth. Not being able to see the person, I assumed they were watching the camp. I didn't know if they had seen me make my way into the woods or not as the fire had been doused and the moon was only half full, so there wasn't much very light. I made my way slowly back to camp as quietly as I could and entered the RV to wake up the professor. I told him about the person smoking in the woods and about the smell of cigarettes earlier that day. However, when we got outside of the RV, the ember from the cigarette was gone. Our professor woke the other student who had it come down with food poisoning and we took turns watching over camp. I didn't see or smell anything else when I was on guard duty and went to sleep when the professor woke up for his turn. In the morning the professor, the other student and I went to where I guess the smoker had been standing the night before and sure enough, we found about 10 cigarette butts on the ground next to a tree. The tree itself looked like someone had been twisting and stabbing a knife or other sharp object into it as the bark and outer layers of wood had been damaged and chipped away. The professor decided that the group should head back that day even though we hadn't collected all the samples we were assigned to be on the safe side. We packed up camp and drove down the thin dirt trail without incident. The second we got on the paved highway though, a white paneled van pulled out of a clearing just off the shoulder and began following us. This van stayed behind us all the way back pulling off the highway when we did, taking the same service streets that we did, and only stopped following us when we turned onto the road leading to our university campus. Everyone was freaked out by this, but it was around 9 at night on a weekend so the security office on campus was closed. We decided to unload the RV and call it a night as the van had it followed us onto campus. I offered to help the professor catalog and store the collection tubes from our trip, so it was another couple hours before I left the biological sciences building and started heading toward the dorm building I lived in. I stepped out into the cool night air and began walking, my professor having left the building in the other direction to get to his car and drive home. It was a couple dozen feet outside of the building, which was now locked, when I was hit with a musty smell of old cigarettes. I looked around and about 25 yards away in the darkness off of the footpath I saw the cherry of a cigarette smoldering away. I was pretty scared at this point, but hoped it was only a student or some faculty staying late having a smoke. I couldn't completely convince myself of this as the musty cigarette smell was the same as what I smelled in the woods the previous night. I started down the footpath and soon passed whoever was smoking. A hundred feet or so later I looked over my shoulder and saw the cigarette cherry bobbing in the darkness. The smoker was following me. This creeped me out a bit more, but I still held it together. That is until I rounded a small stand of trees and saw a white paneled van parked alone in a parking lot. I took off at a sprint toward my dorm building. I looked over my shoulder a few steps into my run, I saw the cherry of the cigarette fall to the ground and a dark shape beginning to move after me. I didn't look back again, but I could hear someone running in the grass off of the footpath. I got to the entrance of my dorm building and frantically waved my key card in front of the card reader that controlled the door lock. As soon as I hear the soft beep I open the door, jump through the doorway and shut the door quickly. I stopped and peered through the glass door. I saw the dark shape stop just short of the lit pathway. 
I just watched for a minute or two. Then I saw the spark of a lighter. The light is just barely bright enough to illuminate a shaggy beard and brim of a baseball cap before it disappears and was replaced with the red glow of a cigarette. I turn and headed up to the stairs to my dorm room. By the time I get to my window overlooking the same yard I had just run through, there's no trace of a dark figure or a cigarette cherry. After that, I didn't see that white paneled van again or smell that musty cigarette smell and I hope I never do. In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto, and we were still stuck living together after the breakup as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping slash fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto called Flamborough. It's really beautiful, loads of lush forest, farmers fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing it was trespassing on our part, bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent the evening fishing, talking, and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all it was a pretty good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably around 1.30 am. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember I was being woken up by a high pitched yipping type noise. I was kinda groggy and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment listening and then started playing on my phone again. The noise was annoying. I tried ignoring it but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet away from the tent. At this point I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake and he was. The noise woke him up too. We discussed what to do about the coyote as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hopefully scaring him off. He unzipped the tent and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled, It's not a coyote, it's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally I would have thought he was messing with me, but I've never seen someone look that scared. And I never want to see that expression on someone's face again. So I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on, and in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote, but I guess in our groggy states it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyways, he kept telling me to just look out the tent flap, to make sure he's not crazy. At this point I was having a full blown anxiety attack, my heart was racing, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust and that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though, what was really creepy, was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to screw off. My buddy started yelling, excuse me, can you go away? We're trying to sleep in here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent and that's when we heard footsteps running towards our tent. They stopped right outside the tent but we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again, seriously screw off. We have cell phones in here, if you don't screw off we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. It sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we laid awake, petrified onto the first set of sunlight. Then we hightailed it out of there. I always wonder what that guy was doing out there, or what was wrong with him. But honestly, I never want to know. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I work at a popular retail store in a mall close to my on-campus apartment. I was home for Christmas break and decided to work Christmas Eve since I was promised time and a half and I could use the money to buy some extra Christmas presents. My childhood home is not very far from my apartment but it's about an hour drive from my work to my childhood home. Our holiday hours were extended this year and I was given a closing shift for Christmas Eve. The store closed at 10pm and the closing shift ended at 1030 meaning that I would be getting home around midnight after swinging through a drive through to grab something to eat. The closing shift at the store usually had two employees and a manager working but the other employee that was supposed to close with me was out sick so it was just me and the manager. While the manager emptied and counted the cash drawers and wrote the daily report, I gathered up all the trash and cardboard and left it all by the back door in the stock room. I dusted and vacuumed until the manager was finished with the daily report and then he put in the combination to disable the alarm 
and held open the back door for me to take out the trash and cardboard. This was the part that was usually the most helpful to have two employees instead of one because the dumpster was walled off and the manager had to wait by the door to make sure no one walked into the store. But the dumpster wasn't too far away and I wanted to get home as soon as possible so I carried all the trash out. Our store shared the dumpster with only three other stores, all of which closed either before or after us, so I wasn't expecting to see anyone at the dumpster. I was so startled that I dropped my bags when I saw someone digging through the trash. He looked up at me when he heard the bags fall. Oh hi, I dropped my wallet in the trash, could you help me grab it? He asked. A thousand red flags went off in my brain and I immediately began to back away. Uh, I don't think I can. I need to take out the trash and get back to my store, I said, trying to walk towards the store slowly. Which store do you work at? He asked. I'm not sure why I told him, but I told him the store I worked at and he nodded. Oh, nice store. You could just see the bags here. I'll toss them when I'm done looking. I went back into the store at that point, a little creeped out but not suspecting anything else. I told my boss what happened and he laughed a little and he offered to walk me to my car as I parked in the lot behind the store and he parked in the parking garage attached to the main mall. I declined and walked in the nearly empty parking lot. There were only three cars in the parking lot including mine. One car was parked close to the back entrance of a neighboring restaurant and the other car was parked just a few spots away from mine. I couldn't see the person inside but the car was on and it looked like the person was trying to warm up the car from the inside before scraping off the ice on the windshield. I glanced at the car a few times just to mentally jot down the make and the model of the car. A blue Honda Accord. Before getting into my car and locking the doors, I called my parents to let them know that I was just now leaving and that I would be stopping to grab dinner on the way home so not to wait up. I kept my eyes peeled for the different fast food joints on the side of the highway but the majority of them were closed as it was 11pm on Christmas Eve. I was getting hungrier and hungrier as I got closer and closer to the exit for my house. I decided to just scrounge up some leftovers at home as I drove through my town when I saw a subway with blinking lights that said, Open late. I peeled into the parking lot of the subway and saw the red LED sign indicating that it was open. I walked into the subway and took a look around as it looked pretty empty. I called out to the empty store and was able to get the attention of the only person working in the store. I thought I'd lock that door, which is closed, he said. Come on man, I just got off work and I just want to grab something to eat before I go to bed. I'll be really quick, I promise. I begged him. He sighed and agreed, probably taking pity on how exhausted I looked. We talked for a little bit about working the late shift on Christmas Eve as he made my sandwich before a group of teenage boys walked into the store. We're closed guys, I'm going to lock the store after I'm done making her sandwich, he said. But I want a sandwich, one of the boys whined. Fine. The subway employee got out from behind the counter and locked the door so no one else would be able to get in and he could ensure that the teenagers would be his last customers of the night. He finished making my sandwich and left me to pick out my drink and chips at the soda fountain. Most of the boys only bought bags of chips or cookies so they were all finished before I finished filling up my soda and the subway employee disappeared into the back. I put the lid to my cup on and was looking for a straw when something caught my eye. The man from the dumpster was waiting in the parking lot next to my car. He was sitting on the hood of the car that was parked next to mine. It was the blue Honda Accord. I really started to freak out at that point. There was no reason for this guy to be in town an hour away from the mall at the exact same place I decided to stop if he wasn't following me. And what was he doing in the hood of his car? It was the day before Christmas. It was snowing and below 30 degrees. I walked out of the subway to my car. I felt a little silly because there was probably a perfectly good reason for the man from the dumpster to be in the parking lot something that didn't have anything to do with me but I was still nervous. The man didn't even look at me as I got into my car. I had about 10 minutes until I got to my house and I tried to shake the weird feeling I got about the man in the dumpster. It took me a little while to notice, but I realized that there was someone following me. It was hard to see because the car's lights were off, but I noticed the car when I glanced at my rearview mirror as I drove under a street lamp. I started to get nervous again and drove past my house and turned back onto the main road hoping I would lose the guy. This car stayed on my tail and I watched in my rearview mirror as we went under a street light again. It was a blue Honda Accord. I pulled out my phone and called 911 and explained the situation to the dispatcher. The dispatcher advised me to drive to the nearest police station and told me she would inform the police station of what was going on. I stayed on the line with the dispatcher until I pulled into the police station. The Honda Accord drove past the station. There was a police car waiting outside the station that drove after the guy but ultimately there was nothing they could besides give him a ticket for driving with his lights off. A description of the man by the dumpster matched the driver of the Accord. I don't know what he had planned but I haven't seen him since and told my boss about the incident so I won't have to take the trash out on my own anymore. I just hope that the man who followed me for over an hour doesn't come back. So at the time this happened I was 21. I work in a very popular retail store and my work environment is very casual. 
We don't have a uniform apart from a lanyard that we wear around our necks, and we are encouraged to chat to customers for however long it takes to help them select an item and to feel comfortable around us so they can come back. Basic retail stuff. Because of this atmosphere, we have a lot of regular customers that come in every week or so. This is probably why I didn't think the following interactions were anything more than a lonely person who wanted to have a chat. So one day I was working and an older man around his late 30s walked up to me and just started chatting about general stuff, asking how I was, what my name was, what section of the store I worked in, etc. Then he left. I assumed he was a regular and that I just hadn't met him yet, so he was introducing himself. His name was Mitchell. Since that first interaction, Mitchell started to come to the store a lot more often. He always wore the same clothes, but surprisingly he didn't smell. He would always come up to me and have a quick chat. He particularly liked to compliment me on the clothes I was wearing, but it wasn't in an overly creepy way. He would say things like, I like your dress, very colorful, or did you make that yourself? You seem like a creative person. I usually wore dresses that came up to my neck or covered my chest completely in some way, always just above the knee. Casual, but still work appropriate. It started off that I would see him once a week, then gradually I started seeing him almost every shift I had. I was only casual at the time, so I worked around three to four shifts a week. Sometimes less, but usually on the same days, just different hours. I now realize he probably worked this out and was stalking me. The only thing I found out about him was his name and he told me that he was a writer. There was a time that I didn't see him for a few weeks but he would eventually reappear. When I did see him, he walked up to me and said, Hey, it's been a while, do you want to go get a coffee and catch up? I immediately replied with a cheery, no thanks. He asked if I had a boyfriend and I said, no I just don't want to. He laughed and said fair enough, then left. I didn't see him for another while after that but I did get a Facebook request from him despite not being friends or telling him my last name. I obviously blocked him. I told my sister Kitty about it and she relayed the following story about a man who fit my description who used to come into her work a few years ago. Now Kitty is two years younger than me. She couldn't remember much apart from him always coming into her work which was a video store when she was the only person on. One day Kitty was on a night by herself and he came in to hire some videos. Katie had her hair in a high ponytail with a white ribbon tied into a bow. They completed the transaction and Mitchell looked at her and said, White is the color of purity. Katie was confused so Mitchell continued, I'm a writer so I have to know this sort of stuff. Are you wearing it because you think you're pure? Katie just awkwardly laughed it off and said she just liked it. Mitchell then left. Katie said the video store closed down and after a while she also sent a friend request and he also messaged her asking her out for coffee. Of course Katie blocked him without replying. We decided to go into his Facebook. Katie unblocked him so we knew it was definitely the same Mitchell. We couldn't see much of his profile but he didn't have any profile pictures of himself. After this, Katie explained that she assumes he must have found her because her place of work used to be on her profile. Not since this incident though. I told my workmates about all of this and one of them named Daniel said that his friend worked at a store across the road from ours and he used to come into her work and do the same thing. He's been reported before and a lot of girls that work in stores around my town have had him stalk them at their workplaces as well. The next time I saw Mitchell coming down from the aisle towards me, I got full spine tingling chills so I turned around and walked out the back and stayed out there until he had left the store. I did this a few more times to give him the message that I did not want to speak with him. The last time I can remember seeing him, he came up to the counter to pick up an item. I turned around when I saw him, I swiftly walked out the back again. I came back out a few minutes later and he was walking away, then all of a sudden, he walked straight back to the counter that I was behind and just stared at me across it before leaving. I rarely see him since I practically ghosted him in the store. He orders in the occasional item and I see his name on it. That's about the extent of our interaction. But if I get called up to help a customer and it's just him, I just palm him off to one of the guys I work with and go out the back. I still get the chills when I see him though. I work at a retail store in a not so nice part of town. Since the area isn't the best, not many people ever come into the store and even less people come in at night. Something important to note is that the store does not have any cameras nor does it have a panic button. So basically, anyone could do anything and we've had many people steal little things here and there. Looking back, this should have been my first clue to quit ASAP. I was working this night shift with me and my coworker. We were joking around and playing on our phones because it was about 7.30pm at this point and no one had come in for about an hour. Suddenly, a group of people, two men and one woman, come in all at once. A side note about these people, they were all wearing black head to toe, facial tattoos, and were very confrontational upon arrival. The woman was a very built woman and I was honestly very intimidated by her. Her friends, the two men, were at least 6 foot each, towering over both me and my coworker who are both 5 foot 3. One of the men immediately asked us what our ages were and complimented me on my smile. I'm kind of awkwardly laughing and trying to be as kind as possible to get these people to leave fast. The woman basically corners my coworker over in one of the aisles so she's unable to walk over to where I am, which is right behind the counter. 
The woman is basically yelling at my coworker, asking her, why don't you hire me? I need to work. Hire me. Pretty much scaring the both of us. While this is going on, one of the men walks over and blocks the door. The other man comes up to the counter and looks at all the $100 to $300 items we have stocked behind the counter and jokes to his friend about how he needs all those items. He then turns to me and says with a deadpan face, give me everything. I awkwardly laugh and say, everything? He then says nothing and continues to stare right into my face for 5 more seconds before repeating everything. So I do just that. I start to take things off the shelves while he points to things saying, give me that, that, and that. He then stops and says, you never asked me how I was going to pay for any of this. The entire time, his friends were saying nothing and standing still while staring at me. The man then breaks his stare and laughs, prompting all of his buddies to laugh along with him and states that they are going to come back. As soon as they leave, I make a beeline to the door and lock it. I call my manager and tell her what happened and I'm begging her to let us close because I do not want these people to come back. As if on cue, they come back and yank on the door, which is locked, and continue to yank it. I tell my coworker to run with me to the back and we lock the back room door and call the police. By the time the police arrive, they are gone. Nothing could be done because of lack of any cameras in the store. The police stayed outside the store and their cars until we closed and walked me to my own car. Throughout this whole ordeal, no one was in the store besides my coworker and I. My theory was they were scoping out the situation before leaving and coming back with a firearm to actually carry out the robbery. Luckily, I had locked the door the moment they stepped out. I don't like to think about what could have happened if I had brushed it off and decided to leave the store open, but I was shaking like a leaf when they really hadn't done anything at all, so I trusted my gut feeling. I quit that job right after the incident. Here is a little bit of background. I was 20 at the time. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super known coffee chain downtown close to the Turtsy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though because I got to know the people there and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple of months into the job and I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers last day. There was about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out which was not unusual for my location. On my break I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I can get a farewells card and maybe a small gift for said coworker. I walked out and put my earphones in and before I could press play I hear the door open behind me and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking beside me matching my pace exactly. I turned to look and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me. He tried to ask for my number and I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper told him to screw off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise. He stood there as I walked away and by the time I went back they were gone. I proceeded to tell my coworkers about the encounter and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid shift. Sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I assumed he was just another homeless person because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Some days I opened, some days I closed, some days I worked mid but it didn't matter he was always there. At that point I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my coworkers and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My coworkers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed a coworker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day of him just staring, I was working the register that day. He walked up and ordered a water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything, we couldn't do anything beside note it in the manager book. The next day I worked with my manager. It was him, two of the co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other, but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register and they weren't gender specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area. I had to pass this table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied, but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door, no one was there, and walking back I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. 
Later that shift, he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed that he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't and that it wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he does something like that, he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. Cut to the Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walk out the bathroom, I see him peeking in with both his hands, pressed to the window, eyes wide, just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second, just staring back. I notice on one of his palms that is pressed to the window, a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and run back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah, Hannah, he's here, he's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help me hide me from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom shouting back, What are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she gets close, she sees him. I told her again, He's here. He's watching me. She started shouting through the window, You need to leave. If you don't leave, we're calling the police. I step out a little to see if he'll leave and he's ignoring her and his eyes were fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him to leave and threatens him with the police. About 5 minutes pass and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves, so he does. The next day, my lead and I told my manager I want to file a police report and he tells me to wait until he talks to his boss. He shows up again that day and I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home, a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I text my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says, I'm scared and I'm gonna file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version. They tell me they're going to send someone to where I live to take the official report. The two officers were nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defend me saying they could get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me that if he shows up to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked at and as we round a corner I see him and so I ducked into a little corner store and my friends follow. I told them I saw him and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view we left the store and that was the last time I saw him. I just hope that he never comes back. I'm in a school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once twice a month and the stadium is off towards the edge of town. It's Friday night and I just gotten out of school and I had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for 4 hours, half shift tonight, and my boss, my aunt, tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream, and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them. I say okay, and I'll go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town, and I still wanted to go meet up with some of my friends and mess around. I decide to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a weather bipolar state. It snowed last night, but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I take off to the store and the first five minutes go by and nothing's wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time, but keep in mind it's approaching 9 p.m. and I'm on the outskirts of town and no one really takes this way in case they really have to. All of a sudden I see something in the corner of my eye and it looks like a man, roughly five foot eight I'd say, wearing shorts, t-shirt, and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch, walking in snow when it's 10 degrees out. My first thought is to pull over, but I'm on the phone with my mom at the time and she warns me not to as some things have happened before in this town. I consider stopping, but for some reason I tell myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I pass the man, going about 40 miles per hour. Like I said, roads aren't the best. I drive not even 500 feet past him and immediately, a car that I did not see at all before turns on and pulls out of a field entrance off the road and starts to follow me. At first I thought I just was focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road and that's where they come from, but I later found out there was not a road there. I start to approach the town again and have to take some turns to get to where I'm going. I turn left, the car turns left. I turn right, the car turns right. I go around a roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there, car follows. At this point, I start to worry a little, but maybe they just need to go to the store also. I then pull up to a stop sign and I turn without my turn signal. The car follows. Now at this point, I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think much of it. I'm two miles from the store, where plenty of people will be. I take a few more turns and the car continues to follow me. I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection and the car does a quick stop and go and catches up. 
At this point, I have two turns till the store, so I'm still not worried. I turn into the store and the car turns also. The store also has a gas station, so I pull there first to act like I was getting gas. The car sets off to the side of the road, in between gas station and store, and just sits there. I wait about 10 minutes and the car doesn't move. At this point, I start to get worried. I call my friends I'm supposed to meet up with later on and give them the license plate for worst case scenario, then take off to the store. I cross the street and the car comes straight behind me. I'm freaking out on the phone, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store, and the car parks three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point and the store is closing soon, there's only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go park on the complete opposite side of the lot, get out and I completely bolt inside the store. I get spoons and take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside and my phone is dead. I look out the sliding doors and suddenly there's a white van next to my driver's side. Looks like no one's in it but the back windows are covered and it's running. I run to customer service and explain everything, but they think I'm some young kid messing around. At that time, I didn't see the original follow car, but no way I'm going outside with that van next to my truck. After waiting for about 30 minutes, the van pulls forward, and the original car appears from the side of the building. I wait another 10 minutes and dash outside. I speed to my friend's house, and when I get there, I park at his garage. My one buddy asked why there's a big orange mark on my tire, and my heart sinks. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting the rest of my truck, we find a small pipe dropped in the bed of my truck surrounded by snow. It was wrapped in duct tape. It was not mine. I was alone, no phone, scared, in a part of town I'm not familiar with. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked outside. Last December, I was visiting my family down in Florida and we spent some time in Treasure Island. My brother and I took my dog down to the beach at about 2am to play some fetch and drink and have a good time. If you walk along the water, you can reach a few restaurants and bars and hotels that line the beach. Out of nowhere, we see someone walking pretty quickly in our direction from over there and a few minutes later, we can make out that they're being followed. My dog is arguably pretty well trained, we work search and rescue, and I've never once had her run off without permission and never once has she not instantly returned when called, but that changed that night. She was about 5 feet from me and I saw her hackle shoot up and I went to grab her collar, but she took off in a full sprint, making some truly terrifying barking and growling sounds. We obviously took off after her and she reached the first person and stopped between them and the people behind them. She was barking and growling and lunging and I finally caught up and put her on a leash. She's never reacted in that manner so it was scary. The group following her ended up being three men that were probably in their early 30s. They started booking it in the other direction. I turned around and the person being followed was a young woman around my age. We asked if she was okay and she just broke down in tears and collapsed into my brother. So she got into her phone and rang her friend's number to have us talk to her. We were able to figure out where she was staying and walk her back to her hotel where we met up with her friends and we all exchanged numbers to talk a later time. The next day we all got together where we learned she had gone out for a walk on the beach, stopped for a drink at the bar, drank a bit and then just wasn't feeling right. So she left the bar and soon noticed three men left after her. She had been walking for about a mile at that point, terrified and slowly getting more and more screwed up. She doesn't remember much about that night and we knew she was probably on something, but we had no clue she'd been drugged. We're still friends now and we're all going to meet up for spring break when we're all back in Florida. I've never been more proud of my dog and more grateful that we were in the right place at the right time. I hate thinking about what could have happened. In April of last year, my boyfriend and I were walking home from our friend's house, and I had just finished my first year at college and we wanted to go out and celebrate and have some fun. We live in a rural town and our friend lived on the far side of it so our walk was about a half an hour or so. I had a drink or two and smoked some of the joint they had rolled. Smoking makes me paranoid and this night was no different. Anyway, we left at maybe 10 or 11 p.m. and everything was perfectly normal until we got to the end of the long street that would eventually lead to my house. This street always feels so long to walk on, like hours can pass and you can barely make a dent in the amount of steps made. The street we turned onto this road was maybe 10 blocks from my house. A few minutes after we turned onto this road, I felt like something was off. But my boyfriend said that I was stoned and reassured me that it was just that. This white pickup truck that was parked in front of some house turns on and begins to drive slowly away and would then park. I watched it to see if it was just me being paranoid or not, but it proceeded to stop a couple houses down and sat there with the car still on. As soon as we get close, it would drive away, parking a little further away. This continued on until we got to the end of my street. At this point I kept telling my boyfriend that I'm not paranoid and that this truck was screaming with us and he had gone quiet. A 
couple of houses down from mine, this truck drives to the end of the street, my house on the corner. There's a dead end by my house because we live near a river. It stops for a moment at the dead end and proceeds to turn on their high beams and begin to slowly drive towards us. My boyfriend takes his arm out in front of me, stopping me from walking any further as this truck continues to approach. My house is so close, yet so far. This truck slowly drives by us. The windows are tinted but we can see two silhouettes, and because they had blinded us we didn't think to look at the license plates or even the model of the truck. My boyfriend being pretty quick on his feet waited until the truck disappeared from sight and took my hand before racing to my house and locking the door. He had thought about turning down one of the other streets so we could try to lose them but he figured he'd wait until they were out of sight to book it to my house so they wouldn't see which house we went in. We looked out one of the front windows very carefully and saw this truck come back into view and began to drive around the block, I'm assuming looking for us. This went on for about 10 minutes. I called the police to inform them that we had been followed, but without the license plates or model, they could only keep their eyes open for suspicious white trucks. I was adamant that these people had to know one of us if not me because they drove until they were beside my house. Whether they actually knew it was my house or not, I don't know. My boyfriend tries to insist that it was probably a bunch of kids trying to mess with us, but I don't believe that. A few days later, we heard that someone was picked up and was last seen in a white truck. Since this night, there have been stories in the paper and online that people have been grabbing people and these people were trafficked in the area. I'm still seeing reports even today. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't close by. We lived out in the country and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town slash city about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day while she got whatever else she needed. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, semi-ill looking, that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles and I said sorry, and since then I had seen him like 5 times and every time I felt a shudder and I looked around and he would be somewhere staring at me. I told my mom and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later, we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well-known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle, and she was on the other. I ended up finding it. I reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. He said something like, you're too pretty to be eating that, it'll rot your teeth, and I freaked out. I pushed past him and ran back to my mom and said, found it, let's go, and she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers, and unfortunately we had a lot of groceries and the old man got in the line next to us and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself, I was keeping a very close eye on him and was relieved when he exited the store, but unfortunately that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store, I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to go leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said, we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about 5-10 to 10 minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said, no, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with a shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbor was about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway that you can't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their guns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. So far since that incident, my family nor I have seen that man again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened a few years ago in my old one person flat. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right for a few days. Like I was sure that food in the fridge was less than I put back the last time, I found pills for my couch on the floor, stuff like that. I lived alone back then, so there wasn't anyone else with access to my flat, or so I thought. Well, one night I woke up around 1 in the morning sweating from a nightmare. Since I was drenched in sweat, I decided to take a shower. So I put my phone up in the bathroom for music, turned on the water, and enjoyed my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never closed it but it still never moves. I took a look at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it. 
and a look at my phone confirmed someone was there, since I could clearly see a reflection on my screen that showed someone was standing next to the shower curtain. It took me a lot not to scream and to keep acting like I didn't notice anything, while silently taking the shower head off the holding and turning the water all the way to hot. Our water got really hot when you cranked it all the way to hot, and a few seconds later steam was raising and the water hurt my feet flowing to the drain. I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person behind. It was a woman and she screamed in pain. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out the shower and ran to the door, taking the key out of the lock and locking it closed behind me. A little later she started to bang on the door, but the door didn't give. I called the cops and went to the kitchen to get my big kitchen knife, just for safety. I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw it missing and realized there was only one place where it could possibly be right now. The police came and arrested the woman, who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat and was evicted after not paying rent. Seems she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work and sometimes at night. I just hope that I never have to experience that again. This happened 5 years ago. I was 25 and used to live alone in a small flat in England, about an hour south of London. It was a medium sized town well known for being a good place to live, with excellent schools, low crime rates, and minimal unemployment. The kind of place where people didn't panic if they left their front door unlocked when they left for work. My flat was on the first floor above pavement level, midway down a hill. There was nobody underneath me, my flat was a kind of bridge with a footpath below it, and my kitchen window was directly over a pavement on a fairly busy road. The flat had a small galley kitchen, a living room, and an upstairs bedroom. There was nobody beneath or above my flat, and because of the hill, my kitchen window was literally face on with the pavement and where people walked. There was a printing company opposite that went out of business and then just grass. I always used to close the blinds once the sun had gone down, but liked having the kitchen window open during the afternoons. It had a safety latch so it didn't open far enough for anybody to reach in and I was not on the ground floor, so I didn't worry too much. One day, I got home from work early, about 5.30, and as it was summer I had the kitchen window open and the blinds open. I'm chopping garlic for my dinner, glance up and see an older man literally stood on the pavement watching me, only a few feet away. I glare back as if to say go away and decide to walk out the kitchen into the living room as if I'm talking to someone. I walk back into the kitchen, glance at the window and the man is still there watching me with a small smile on his face. At this point I am slightly panicked, I am alone, nobody's around as I have no direct neighbors. I go into the living room and sit against the wall, clutching my phone. I didn't want him to be able to see me at all. A lot of front doors in England have a kind of two door system, directly on the street you have a glass door, normally with decorations on them so you can't see everything in and out, just blurred images, and a proper wooden door inside. I had been out for a smoke so the glass door was shut and locked but the wooden door was wide open. From where I'm sitting, I can see the glass door, and I see a figure walking towards it. Sure enough, as it gets closer, I can see that it's the man from the pavement, standing at my front door and trying to look in. He tries opening the door, but luckily, I lock the outside door after my smoke, and it was a strong door. He drops a cigarette, says, screw it, and after about 15-20 to 20 seconds, he turns around and walks away. I run to shut and lock the wooden door and go to the kitchen window as he walks away and down the road. Just before he turns the corner, turns around and smiles at me, making eye contact. A few days later, it was on the local news that a man matching his description chased down a group of young women in my neighborhood. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son who was 8 months old at the time and with my dog named Henry who was an Irish wolfhound and Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and then meet them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. I would wear him in a forward facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was excited. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine. A crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and all three of us would play. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone about three miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s. Henry was snarling and lunging for the man, before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry would not calm down. This is very unusual behavior for him, but... None if he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. 
The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. Then he motioned to something around his neck and said, I'm just out here taking pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. I am positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son again. He took a few steps off trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him when we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left, he muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as we walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare after us for several minutes though until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars would park. There was no one there and luckily I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away and they took us back to my car. There was no son of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away and I am sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He was really the best dog ever. So thanks Henry for being gentle yet fierce. I hope I never have to see that photographer ever again. I'm an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my early 20s living in remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, Yukon, and British Columbia. I have many odd, frightening, and bizarre stories that came up from my time in the north, and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012 when I was 22, I'm 26 now, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in the provincial part of the Alaskan Highway. 4 hours north of Fort Nelson and 2 hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had beautiful natural hot springs, which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet, and driving 4 hours to Fort Nelson every 2 weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs, make some traveling friends, and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground was being a park facility operator, gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You're aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. One night, at probably around two in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and I'm awoken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and see a car with its lights on and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. To the door I say how can I help you and one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me and the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically he says that him and his friend are on vacation, came up from Fort Nelson to party, they had a really long drive, were at the hot springs, they were having beers, and they were sorry about having beers. And then he drops the bomb that somebody's running around the campground, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, yes, someone's running around stabbing everybody. Then the other guy yells, come on, let's go, and they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them any further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door, in the darkness, alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger, and his cabin is about a 5 minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. His radio is off of course. The only thing I can do at this point is go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived. 
and I tell him the whole story. While I'm there, he calls the police and they tell him that they are on the way and they will be there in four hours. The ranger grabs my gun, walks me back to my trailer, and says, don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me, the intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze. My heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm just sitting there on my bed in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is and I peer out the window of my trailer and a bison is scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. The RCPM get there at around 6.30am and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs in the entire campground. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. Not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident, of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer, he was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friends stopped by my trailer to try to make it seem like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. I just hope that I never have to wake up to someone like that at my door again. A couple of years ago, I was still adjusting to the adult dating scene. I was using Tinder, and though I had been on a few dates and had a few hookups, it was mostly just situations where I either wasn't that interested in the guys, or it was strictly a one night stand. It was a college town, not where I went to school, about 45 minutes from my parents' house, and I went on a few dates there. It's a cool city to hang out in, so it was always worth the journey even if a date didn't work out. I started chatting with this guy who I matched with on Tinder. He wasn't exactly my usual type, but he was charming enough. He was a little bit of the stoner slash alternative type. He was funny and confident over the phone as well. I usually made it a rule for myself to chat on the phone at least once or twice before meeting up with guys even just to gauge if we would be able to carry a conversation. It's not the same when you're only texting. We hit it off over the phone well enough to the point where I felt we should give hanging out a shot. We talked about how I went to karaoke night often at a local bar close to where I attended school. He said he and his friends liked going to karaoke too. Great. He lived in the previously mentioned college town and I agreed to attending karaoke night with him and his friends. He said they were hanging out at a local coffee shop near where he and his roommate lived and I could meet them there. A girl he knew worked there as well, and he said she'd give me a coffee on the house. Before leaving, I texted one of my friends where I was going, just to be safe. When I arrived, I could clearly see into the coffee shop. I could see a group of four scraggly looking dudes, and one girl behind the counter. As soon as I pulled up, I got a nagging bad feeling in my stomach. As soon as I got out of the car, the guy I'd been chatting with left his group and came out. He said they were leaving right now so we should just go. Not that I really cared about the coffee, but what happened to the coffee I was promised. I asked exactly what the plan was and he said they were going to head back to his place before heading to karaoke. He didn't ask if I wanted anything from the shop and didn't even ask if I wanted to come in. By this point, his friends came out and they all got close to my car. I was getting pretty bad vibes at this point. He isn't acting charming or funny like before on the phone. Everything felt forced. There was an error from the group that they were only pretending to be friendly. Nobody introduced themselves, but they just kept saying how awesome karaoke at the bar was. The girl inside at the counter had gone in the back of the shop and because she was friends with him, I didn't know if I could trust her. Thinking quickly, I said the plan sounded great and I could drive and meet them there, that I didn't want to leave my car there. This apparently was a problem. The one car in the parking lot, which I assumed was one of theirs, was the girls. They said they walked there, but it would be a lot better and faster if I just drove them back to the house. At this point I'm freaking out a bit. Everyone's close to my car and me. I tell them a stupid lie and say that I have a bunch of stuff from school in my car and it's pretty messy on top of that so not everyone will be able to fit in. Mind you, they are right by my car, standing in front of it. They can see through my windshield into it. It's got like a backpack in it, and that's just it. I just lie and say I'm kind of embarrassed because the floor is messy. I'm saying anything I can get to get out of this. I tell them I'm really sorry, but if they order an Uber, I could just meet them at their place. I'm not budging on not letting them get in my car. The guy I'm supposed to be on a date with tells the other guys to head back inside the coffee shop, and now I'm alone with them. He asks why I can't just drive everyone. He tells me it's not a big deal, and that it's just easier if I just drive everyone there. I stand firm that there's not room and my car's messy. I tell him I promise to meet him at his place if they order an Uber or walk, just text me his address. He says that it'll take too long to get back to his place, so I should just meet them at the bar instead. He won't give me his address. He texts me the address to the bar, and I apologize about the car thing. 
I tell him I'm so excited for karaoke and I'll meet him there. I smile and act as naturally as possible, and then I get in my car and try to drive normally while in view. As soon as I'm out of sight, I take off and just drive in different directions haphazardly before heading back home. I was constantly watching in my mirrors to see if anyone followed me, and thankfully nobody did. Not long after arriving home, I got multiple texts from him. He told me I was just another girl pretending to be nice and that I deserved to die. Clearly I made the right call. I blocked his number and blocked him on Tinder. I never heard from him again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a movie, and then to get ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though, my parents were happy and proud of my sister, we had a great time, and we took up our time getting home. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my room to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember thinking that it seemed a little more chilly in the house that night, but that's the only thing out of the ordinary I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew it was bad because I heard fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really bad. I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there, and her and my parents were standing very close. My mom looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked my mom what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me. She said we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to a 911 operator and telling them that when we got home, he found out her back sliding glass door shattered and objects strewn about the kitchen. He went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me. The police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside and flashing lights illuminating our entire street for hours. They never found anybody in our house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. The thing that gets to me is that nothing was stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did take was our canned food out the pantry and stack them into a small pyramid on our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to a different parts of the house. It was like someone had been in our home and did things for reasons that only made sense to them. As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mom a question. They talked quietly, and I'm sure they thought I didn't hear. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. We kept magnetized letters on our fridge, and we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mom if the message on there that night was done by any of us. It wasn't. I watched my mom turn pale when we told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day. It said, always watching. The police didn't find any fingerprints. They said the intruder had to be wearing gloves. For the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. Within a few months, we decided to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area. We moved to a house several miles away. We were never bothered again, but I do still think about it. This happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck still stand up sometimes to this day. I just wish that we never experienced something like that again.